I think this is the pitch that out of all of our pitches would absolutely not get made. Okay. No studio would approve this as it is. I'm about to put Nick Morton through hell. In 2017, Universal Studios announced the birth of a new shared universe of monster movies, bringing their classic horror icons into the contemporary franchise film landscape. But after the critical and financial failure of its first installment, the project was indefinitely abandoned. Now, in 2022, the powers that be have called upon one pulp horror devotee and one snarky film critic to unearth the concept. I'm Dylan Roth. And I'm Dalton DeShane. Are you afraid of the dark universe? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a giant-sized episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark Universe? I am one of your hosts, Dalton DeShane. I'm the other of your hosts, Dylan Roth. And we are back to... I know we've kicked off Phase 2 twice already. But this time, we really mean it. We're really kicking it off with an actual new movie, the first film of Phase 2. The first film after our immensely successful Dark Legion crossover film, House of Dracula... Uh, And we are kicking things off with the sequel to the only movie that actually exists in the (laughs) Dark Universe. Uh, Today, I will be pitching The Mummy Returns. I am so excited to hear this. Uh, You've been very appropriately like tight-lipped about any details about the movie. Only every once in a while, the text me with something like, uh, I really freaked myself out with something in this movie. I'm really excited about it. And then to tell me, Uh, how fucking long the script is. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so today's episode is a bit longer. We've been trying to keep our episodes to about an hour and have failed many times. It's never happened, yeah. (laughs) uh, We try to keep them around an hour, but we figured uh, a lot of people are enjoying the podcast. And, you know, this is the beginning of phase two. It's uh, characters we know already. And uh, look, I also had a lot of time between Dark Legion and now because we took a little break. We had the holidays. So I have had a lot of time to really ruminate on this script um, and ended up writing like 13,000 words for this. <laughs> uh, essentially, oh. fan fiction. We're essentially just I mean, writing. This, this is a fan, fan fiction. Fic. Yeah, yeah. It's a fanfic podcast. It is basically. a fanfic podcast, basically, which is funny considering that the episode after this is going to be <laughs> specifically about fan fiction. And we'll tell you more about that. Yes. But it's. Um, I don't know. Now that we're, we're we're spreading out our schedule a little bit, now we have one like movie a month. Uh, so I feel like it's not as much of a crime for them to be like the length, closer to the length of the movie that it's going to be. Yeah, and if you're, you know, we're always open to feedback. So if you want the episodes to be longer, if you want them to be shorter, let us know. You yeah, know, you we're can reach us. Open. Yeah, you can reach us on Twitter or Instagram at Dark Universe Pod, mm-hmm. or you can email us at Dark Universe Pod at Gmail dot com. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you can. Oh, I didn't even. I don't. I don't. We've never mentioned it on the okay. show before, oh, but I have used, an email. I use it to set up a couple of our, um, a couple of our accounts. Great. Uh, <laughs> so, because there is a lot to get to, uh, let's jump into some mummy talk. Because the other thing is, like, I've been, I've been so mummy pilled over the past <laughs> couple months. I have watched so many mummy movies i watched the entire brendan fraser trilogy including tomb of the dragon emperor i rewatched the 2017 mummy which we will get into i watched the hammer mummy uh with christopher lee and peter cushing fantastic i watched so many special features for the brendan <laughs> the fraser ones and for the tom cruise ones yeah, I if, watched- if you if you listen to the previous episode uh where we talked about uh video games in the dark universe Dalton went through all of the bonus features on the 4K of the 2017 Mummy, including getting into a long dialogue with Universal support about a missing feature that's been discontinued. Yes, I bought the VR edition of the 2017 Mummy 4K Blu-ray, which came with a VR headset for, to put your phone in so you could watch VR special features that don't exist anymore. On some crazy chance out there, if you are out there and you own those VR special features, please get in touch with that email from earlier and send them to me. Because now I have this Mummy VR headset uh (laughs) and i can't use it but uh i also uh played the mummy video games for the episode we did last i even by coincidence for christmas got the great pyramid of giza lego set i showed up to i showed to record last time and i'm like is this part of the bit (laughs) (laughs) i was building that pyramid while watching mummy movies it's all right let's talk about 2017 a little bit (laughs) Many of you may have seen on the Dark Universe Twitter account, I live tweeted re-watching the 2017 Mummy with Tom Cruise, and I was more forgiving this time than I was when we watched it for the first episode. I want to be clear, 
I don't think it's a good movie. <laughs> but there are things I appreciate more about it, especially after watching the special features. First of all, I say in the first episode of this podcast that, you know, Tom Cruise's character is bad, but I don't think it's his fault. I think it's the director's. I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> I, if you watch the special features for the 2017 Mummy, you would be forgiven for thinking that Tom Cruise directed that movie. It seems like everybody was subservient to Tom on that. It was like, as soon as Tom came on, apparently the, his character and his character's arc was his idea. He was like, I want there to be a scene where I wake up in a body bag in a morgue. And the director was like, uh, okay, so we have to kill you? And he's like, yeah, just write it. And they'd like figure out a way to like kill him and bring him <laughs> back. That wasn't in the script. Um, it was his idea to do like the zero G stunt in when the plane crashes, you know, because that was just a type of stunt he wanted to do. So what you're saying is everything else that we've written for Tom Cruise's character so far in our series still has to first and foremost get the get the uh, rubber stamp from Tom Cruise. And get the rewrite from Tom yes. Cruise that then we have to fit in. And so I think look, we've discovered like the next phase of our podcast. You know, after after Universal has uh reviewed our entire it, like saga's worth of stuff and approved it, then we have to have the episode where Tom Cruise gives us all of uh, all the show notes, <laughs> which I want to take a moment to uh be a, a little more humble than we sometimes are on this show. We, we've done, especially on like our phase two kickoff, we were very proud of the work we've done. I'm like, hey, we made it like a good dark universe. We're really happy. But the stakes and obstacles are so low for us. Like, I want to be clear. <laughs> we know that what we're doing is not making movies. No. We, we get to do whatever the fuck we want. And we don't have Tom Cruise being like, okay, but you also have to do this. Figure it out. Yeah, there are exactly two cooks in this kitchen. Mm -hmm. And uh, neither of us has like, millions of dollars at stake yes or has to answer to anyone except for you the listener who so far have uh have not made any demands of us so i want to be clear alex kurtzman i don't think i'm better than you i'm not trying to say that i am better at your job or anyone like that we are we are doing a very different thing a much easier thing you it, it really was you need a director that i guess can just not only wrangle tom cruise but take his ideas and then just find a way to really make them work, which like, I feel like, uh, Chris McQuarrie Chris is, McQuarrie the, guy. is yeah. like the Tom, peak of that. I used to think like maybe Chris McQuarrie was the Tom Cruise whisperer, but maybe more it's like, it's the other way around where it's like Tom Cruise has found somebody who, who can execute his vision effectively, which and those movies are good. I like Chris McQuarrie. Oh, absolutely. And I want to be clear. I also don't think I'm better than Tom Cruise. Uh, like I actually think his ideas were good ideas. I just don't think in the, end version they end up meshing like i don't think anyone took the time to really stitch all of the different visions together um but there are things that i like about it i i was really appreciating this time the set design and art direction like they're uh, watching the special features they built so many like physical sets for this which is something that does not happen in marvel movies like <laughs> like there there weren't just on like there's very little just like green screen on this of like we're on an entirely green screen set i don't know if there's any like they built sets i think the uh design of the monsters is cool i think the design of prodigium is cool even though we have our problems with prodigium mm -hmm. like i think the look of the film is very cool i think there's some great action sequences the zero g plane crash is really cool sure it, like it looks great and it obviously looks better than any action sequence in a Marvel movie because they actually did it. Because that's what Tom Cruise is good at. Tom Cruise is good at being like, hey, this is going to be a cool action scene that's never been on film and making it happen, you know? Yeah, and, and putting his own ass on the line, to be fair, about yeah. it. But it's just the matter that the pieces did not come together. It was, uh, and it was also, I think, probably an extent to which they were like, how could this possibly go wrong? It's Tom Cruise. It's Universal Monsters. It's the beginning of a cinematic universe, which everyone likes you know, as an idea where, and we have the advantage of knowing that that didn't work. <laughs> here's, here's what I think went wrong. I, I have, I've kind of come to three things that I think went wrong with the mummy movie. Number one, I think the idea for Tom Cruise's arc is actually a pretty good one. When you hear them talk about it, basically they wanted to have Tom Cruise's character starts out as this morally irredeemable thief with no soul who by the end of the movie finds his soul and becomes a better person. But in order to gain that soul, he actually actually has to literally give up his soul. And that's like, I think, a clever arc for your monster movie is like, oh, this bad person becomes good, but in order to become good, it has to actually let literal evil inside. That's interesting. It does not read in the film. Not at all. Not at all, because... I, it's never clear that you're not supposed to like Tom Cruise. No, it seems like he, they're aggressively trying to be like, 
oh, this fucking guy. Exactly. And they they keep talking in the special features like we got to keep adding humor. We don't want it to be too dour, too dark. And I think they just try to keep making Tom Cruise charming. And like Tom Cruise doesn't seem to want you to not like him. Like he's being charming. It, it really he really doesn't read any different than any other male action hero where it's just like you could oh, put he's... Chris Pratt in there. Right. And it would honestly feel more appropriate. It wouldn't be better, but it feels like that's <laughs> yeah. the kind of persona that he's putting yeah, on. Yeah, he's the Jurassic. He's literally Chris Pratt in Jurassic World, but you're supposed to like him in Jurassic World, and in this one you're not, but they're really doing the same thing. And I feel like the linchpin of this is like there's that scene where Annabelle Wallace says, I know you're a good person because you gave me the last parachute. And Nick Morton says, I thought there were two. And it is so unclear whether that is a laugh line or not. Uh-huh. I, you, I honestly, on the second watch, could not tell if they wrote that as a joke or if that was supposed to be a sincere character moment where you're supposed to be like, oh, he was a piece of shit, but people can change. <laughs> you know, like, uh, So that's, that's problem one, is that, yes, the idea for that journey is great. It, it is not visible on screen. I think the second part is the mummy part of it. The mythology is way too complicated and doesn't add up. Right. Uh, we we talked so much about how awful that like opening monologue, like the 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 lore right. monologue is, which I didn't realize I had forgotten that all of the Brendan Fraser movies also open with that with like yes, a, a but narrator. But they work there. They work. And I think the reason is like the stuff with set is unnecessarily complex. You've got Aminette who's like got a reason you know, she kills the Pharaoh and and his wife and, and his son and stuff and, like, in order to gain power. But that never ends up playing into what she wants when she comes back because they add this wrinkle of Set, which is she calls on Set to give her that power, but then, okay, now she needs to also find someone that's not her to be the body of Set. And so when she comes back, it has nothing to do with her killing the Pharaoh or her wanting... It's just, I need to finish finding a body for Set. And it's like, well, who is Set? Have we seen? Have we met him? Like, what? What is he? Yeah, like, and that's where we can kind of suspect that it had to do with trying to play the very long game with Set as like their big bad, which we are now executing. Well, but, and also maybe with what Tom Cruise wanted for his character, like, oh, well, I have to become evil. Okay, well, then we have to find something that makes Tom Cruise evil and makes it so he doesn't die in the plane crash. And so, okay, well, what if she needs to find a body for another God? Like it, it all just kind of gets very messy and mm-hmm. you don't know what she wants when she comes back. You're not invested in it. You know, yeah, and we uh, talk about throwing away all the ideas about like, again, you don't have to make gender the thing, but they, they, they made choices to kind of direct you in that way where it's going to be a little bit about what was taken from her and then they just don't use it. Well, and, you, and you know, like the thing with like every other mummy movie is their love stories. They are mm-hmm. like cross century love stories where Imhotep or uh, whoever the mummy is, uh, is trying to find their lost love. And the reason they became mummified was because of a love story. You know, like that is a very simple idea. The third thing that I think... Um, doesn't work. That's not so much about what's on screen, but the whole conception of it is we live in an age of the requel as Scream 5 very helpfully pointed out for all of us that like, I think Hollywood learned in the early 2000s that when you're rebooting a property, you can't just start from scratch anymore. Mm -hmm. People want to be rewarded for having seen movies before. And so now anytime you have like a franchise thing, the movie at least partially has to be a movie about movies. Uh, is how I kind of look at a lot of requels. Like, The Force Awakens is not really a new standalone Star Wars movie. It is a movie about Star Wars movies and what you love about Star Wars movies to, to many people think, a detrimental effect. You know, there are a lot of people that don't like Force Awakens because it's too much like A New Hope. Then The Last Jedi is sort of the opposite <laughs> thing, where it does try to bring a new and original story, and then you have a lot of people revolting against absolutely that. absolutely hated that, yeah. Because it's, it's, it's too different. And some things are better able to bridge that gap, like Spider-Man No Way Home. Mm-hmm. Is it, it ends up being a pretty good, effective Peter Parker story, but it is a movie about, about Spider-Man About movies. all previous Spider-Man movies. And, and you can say the same thing, like, obviously they're commenting on it specifically, but Scream 5 is, like, I think really nails it and I that think it is five yeah it easily could be your first scream movie but also it's speaking it speaks to all the things that the original was about in a new context and mm-hmm. really rewards your continued investment i think scream five is the best requel but i think it was also poised to be that because scream movies are already movies about movies sure like that's what they're designed to do right don't want to derail us just want to add that the best requel is creed <laughs> uh and now moving on <laughs> um the mummy feels 
dated in that it feels like a relic of like the early 2000s reboots where it's like they thought they could just get rid of everything. The thing with that doesn't work with The Mummy is the reason The Mummy is a property at all from, you know, 1932 is because America had King Tut fever and like King <laughs> Tut had just been discovered. And also America going into the 20th century had this fetishistic love affair with non-white exoticism, right? And like the fact that like, oh, this body was discovered and there were curses on the tomb. It was so like, it's such like a Barnum and Bailey kind of, right. you know. This big or- orientalism idea mm-hmm. like, like, okay, this is, it's, 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 other and therefore like magic and unknowable and mysterious as if there are not still people there for whom it's just history. Like I talked in the first episode about how mummy, you know, a lot of horror is fear of the other. Well, the other in the mummy is non-white culture. And I think that it's a very similar thing to like voodoo in horror, uh, which I think, which I think is more explicitly racist, but Mm -hmm. like, it's the same kind of thing where it's like, oh, here's an actual aspect of this culture that is not familiar to us. So it's scary and let's make it scary. And that sort of fetishism is not as pronounced anymore. Like, I don't think audiences were seeing a trailer for New Mummy and being like, ooh, ancient Egypt, and wow, we're going to learn the secrets of the pharaohs and stuff. Like, no, when you see a trailer for a Mummy movie now, you think, oh, I love those Brendan Fraser movies. Uh Like, and this uses 0% of that DNA, right? It, It doesn't take any bit of the Brendan Fraser movies and tries to create something completely new, but... Instead of replacing that with something really compelling, it says, well, we want you to be invested in this new franchise, too. So we're actually not going to give you the thing that as a moviegoer you're excited about, which is your memories of these Brendan Fraser movies. We want you to instead be excited about all the money we're going to make about this, <laughs> with this franchise. Will you do that for us? And then the movie, of course, is not good on top of that. But I think audiences were particularly kind of furious about the idea of a mummy movie that didn't get the give them what they want and instead demanded that they want something that the studio wanted instead mm-hmm. this is so much preamble it's a I, lot we should get into it I, we I, we got to get into the movie so anyway uh i could talk for hours about the mummy like i said i've been so mummy pilled i've been thinking nothing but ancient egypt thoughts my job with the mummy returns <laughs> <laughs> i had to make a sequel to a movie that actually exists i couldn't just start over with mummy lore I had to make it a sequel to The Mummy 2017. It also has to be a sequel to The Dark Legion House of Dracula. But I needed to do something that I felt like corrected some of the mistakes of the 2017 Mummy and created what I thought was a good story. What I've crafted here is I love it. I think this is the pitch that out of all of our pitches would absolutely not get made. Okay. It is structurally very weird. Uh, no studio would approve this as it is. Uh, but I am very excited about it, and I think it's a good entry in our dark universe. I'm about to put Nick Morton through hell, and uh, you're going to listen to it. All right. <laughs> the director of The Mummy Returns, and I can talk more about why later, is Remy Weeks, who is the director of the incredible Netflix horror film His House, which you should watch if you haven't already. I made Dylan watch it for this, and he, he loved it. I thought it was everything that I would want out of a horror movie. It's fantastic. The thing was uh, with the director is that we've been talking about wanting more diverse directors, and I, so I was very specifically looking for a non-white dude director for this, uh, which was a little strange because... The Mummy is sort of our most white dude <laughs> action blockbuster kind of franchise. Now, see, here's what here's what I like about this though. There is like I know that you have to like acknowledge that Marvel has been opening the gates open and both on screen and and be and behind the screen in terms of trying to increase diversity, but they only ever seem to hire women or people of color to direct stories about those right groups, right? And like I get why you want that. But you should also, like, they offered Patty Jenkins Thor The Dark World. That's cool to do. Yeah. Right? No, they didn't end up didn't end up working out, right? But that's one thing that when she was voicing her her frustrations about Marvel and DC, respectively, she said, DC would never have offered me a Superman movie. They mm-hmm. wanted a woman's name on the movie more than they wanted me to direct the movie. Right. Right? That should happen more. You can, it's okay to, you, like, you, you should, Sorry, I'm going into this too much, but like <laughs> being like, no, it's cool. He's a good director. Let him direct the movie. Yeah, exactly. Remember, it doesn't we, have to be about, you know, whatever, uh, whatever sort of demographic you fit into. I think there are elements of his house that he will really bring and elevate to the mummy returns. At the same time, it's hard not to like 
think about him and be like, this movie's kind of beneath him in a way. Like his house is such a powerful and like meaningful movie that like, let's have him do like this horror action movie with Tom Cruise. Like it would be such a huge step up career wise, but like, I, I think he, instead uh, that that's like the wrong way to think about it. I think he would elevate the material by bringing his perspective. Sure. To it. And also let's get this man paid. Yes. <laughs> Remy Weeks, please make more movies. I love you. Okay. That's a lot of preamble to a long movie. (laughs) I might have to cut a lot of that. Okay, submitted for the approval. Submitted for the approval of the Universal Studios Board of Directors. I present Dalton DeShane's The Mummy Returns. Act One. As the dark universe theme fades, we hear the voice of David Bowie giving a classic... That's right, we're doing the thing where we start our franchise film with an 80s rock needle drop. This time the song is It's No Game, Part 1, the opening track from the 1980 Bowie album appropriately titled Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. The song notably opens with Japanese actress Michi Hirota speaking the song's lyrics in Japanese, which, along with the on-screen text, tells us that we are in Tokyo, Japan. It's the morning rush hour, and the camera travels through the crowded streets at eye level, making the viewer feel like they're pushing their way upstream through an endless sea of people. As David Bowie desperately screams, No more free steps to heaven, the title card appears. The mummy returns. Underneath the title card, the camera has stopped and turned up to look at an enormous cruise ship docked in the harbor. A giant bandage swoops in from out of frame and covers the screen, erasing the title and ship. We zoom out to see Carson, a black man in his late 20s, wrapping the bandage around his forearm. He stands in the tiny bathroom in his cabin on the cruise ship, wincing in pain. His adoptive mother, Margie, yells at him from the other room. Carson, are you ready yet? Almost, Mom. Someone left their curling iron on in this broom closet of a bathroom, and now my arm is burnt worse than the coffee in the cafeteria. Margie sticks her head in. She's an elderly white woman dressed in classic corny white woman on a cruise vacation attire. Oh, honey, I'm sorry. Are you okay? Yeah, I'll be fine. I put some Neosporin. Great, then hurry up. We need to catch that nice young man next door before he leaves. Carson rolls his eyes, and the two of them exit their cabin right as their neighbor does the same. It's Nick Morton, played by Tom Cruise. Nick says hi to Margie and Carson, who he knows by name, and Margie excitedly greets him back. Carson points to the bandage on his arm and says, Hey, twins. The camera cuts to Nick's hands, which are completely covered in bandages that look like they continue up under the sleeves of his hoodie. Nick gives a weak laugh and changes the subject, asking what their plans are for the day. Margie says she was hoping Nick could help guide them around the city, especially since he always knows the best restaurants to go to. Carson interrupts and tells her to leave the man alone. Mom, I can find us a place to eat. Oh, fat chance, Carson. You don't even know how to pronounce sashimi. I'm sorry, guys. I'm really not feeling well today. I think I gotta lie low around here. Oh, Nikki, that's awful news. If you feel better, please come rescue us. I'm sure with Carson's directions, we'll be lost by lunchtime. Hey. You'll be fine, Margie. Carson won't steer you wrong. If you say so, Nikki. Ooh, what do you think of my hat? Margie puts on one of those conical rice hats, which is, of course, very racist on her. Carson and Nick lock eyes, and Carson gives a look that says, I know, man, I tried. Nick says, Now, Margie, why on earth would you want to cover up those beautiful curls of yours? She blushes and takes the hat off. Ooh, you're right. See, Carson, that's how you charm a lady. You should be taking dating advice from Nikki here. As they set off, Carson mouths, thank you, to Nick. Nick smiles. Once they leave, he heads to the railing of the level he's on and watches the thick crowd of tourists disembarking into the city, including Carson and Margie, still bickering. Then he turns his gaze to the rear of the ship, where another ramp has been set up. This one isn't for passengers, but for the workers of the ship, and leads to the off-limits lower deck storage areas. About two dozen men and women in formal dress are being led onto the boat, all showing some sort of ticket to a man with a clipboard. Nick sneaks his way down to the employees-only lower decks, maybe swiping a keycard or disguising himself as a worker or something. He peers around a corner and sees employees cracking open large wooden crates. Inside are glass boxes holding various ancient relics. Some are Egyptian, but not all. There are also bones and skulls of various unrecognizable animals, and even the pointy-toothed skull of a vampire, similar to the one seen in Prodigium's vaults in the 2017 Mummy. A voice is heard from nearby, calling numbers and asking for bidders. We realize we're backstage at a secret auction being held in the ship. 
Nick passes through the backstage area and eyes one particular artifact, a gold bejeweled necklace. He looks around and sees no one watching him and considers it... But no, his thieving days are behind him. He heads up some stairs and walks out into the top row of a large amphitheater. The tiered seats are filled with the formally dressed guests seen outside, holding up numbered paddles and bidding on the artifacts which clutter the stage area below. Nick takes a seat, and the next artifact is wheeled out. It's a box inscribed with hieroglyphics, which the auctioneer says contains the last known scroll with directions to the lost oasis of Am Sher. Bidding begins. As the price climbs into the tens of millions, one man is always willing to outbid. He sits in the front row, and we only see him from behind at an angle, but viewers will recognize the jaw and unusual dress of Indrid Cold, played by Killian Murphy. Finally, nobody can or will outbid Indrid, and the auctioneer gives his going once, going twice. Nick stands suddenly and shouts, wait! Every head in the room turns to look at him, except Indrid. He keeps staring straight forward, his face obscured from the viewer. The auctioneer says, Would you like to place a bid, sir? Uh, yes. Yes, I would. And what is your price? My price? Nick raises both bandaged hands in a grand gesture. How about all the sands of Egypt? Everyone waits, confused. Nothing happens. Nick whispers urgently to himself, Come on, not now. I need you to work with me this time. I'm sorry, do you want to place a bid or not? I summon the sands of Egypt! Nick throws his hands in the air again, and at first nothing happens. Then every glass box on the stage (laughs) explodes into dust at the same time with a loud bang, mirroring the ability Aminet uses in the 2017 Mummy to turn glass into sand. The sand whips around the room, and in the chaos, a horde of spiders crawls up the podium and begins to carry the Egyptian box away. The auctioneer goes to give chase, but he is beset by even larger, hairy spiders which crawl all over him and bite him. Just going to interrupt to say, you're bringing in superpowers that Nick has from the Mummy video game? So, yes, (laughs) from the iOS game that we talked about. uh, But I actually had these powers for him before because these are powers Aminet had in the 2017 one. So I was like, it makes sense that he would have them. Okay. Nick flees through the back hallways, eventually meeting up with the spiders and grabbing the box for himself. He is followed by a group of armed men, presumably working for whatever shady organization is running this black market auction. And we get a chase scene through Tokyo. I'm going to gloss over a lot of the details for time's sake, but the important part is that this chase is crowded. Nick is drowning in a sea of people everywhere he goes. Too many tourists, too many citizens, too many bad guys. After a lot of presumably very fun action choreography that Dylan would probably be better at staging than I am, Uh uh, Nick finally dodges the bad guys and gets a breather in a nearby plaza. He hurriedly opens the box and takes out a scroll that's so ancient it begins to crumble as soon as he touches it. He reads it quickly before it all falls like snow to the sidewalk. Just then, a motorcycle zooms around a corner in the distance. More bad guys heading right for Nick. But something else catches Nick's eye. Margie and Carson eating lunch outside at a restaurant nearby. Margie sees Nick and stands up, running into the street to wave at him. Nick yells out as the motorcycle bears down on her, and at the last second, Carson knocks Margie aside and is hit by the motorcycle himself. We see the gnarly impact, his body flying limply through the air, and we see him land on his neck sideways, instantly killing him. Nick rushes over and yells at the sobbing Margie to stand back. He reaches out his hands to attempt to revive Carson, but again, nothing happens. Nick loses his cool and screams for Set to obey him. His body stiffens, his irises double, and his face distorts into a sharp-toothed monster, but the bandages finally shoot from his wrists and wrap Carson up, as we've seen happen before when Nick brings someone back to life. A yellow light glows from within, and then Carson is coughing and pulling the bandages off, alive again. Nearby, the men from the motorcycle are standing up groggily from where they crashed. Nick, fully taken over by Set, turns to them and screams, His hands reach out and suck the life from them, turning them into emaciated corpses. Nick shakes his head and blinks and turns back to himself, only to find Carson and Margie holding each other and staring at him in horror. Nick mutters a weak apology just as police begin to arrive. He runs off and retreats down into the subway. We cut to Nick crammed into a Tokyo subway car, squeezed on all sides. He's clearly anxious and keeps trying to make more space for himself, but there isn't any to make. We focus in on his heart rate and his breathing as they both accelerate. 
When the car finally stops, he throws himself out, gasping for breath. He finds a hotel and enters his room, finally able to relax. He pulls up the sleeves of his hoodie, and we can see that the bandages end at his mid-forearm, but his skin past that has turned as black as charcoal and is cracked and seeping blood. Then, a loud knock on the door makes Nick jump. Nick opens it a crack, and Indrid Cold pushes his way into the room. He is dressed characteristically strangely, in a reflective trench coat that seems to shimmer with purples and greens, pants that don't reach his ankles, and a collared shirt buttoned so tight his neck wrinkles around it. Nick objects to the intrusion and demands to know who he is. My name is Indrid Cold. I'm a former colleague of your friends Dr. Halsey and the late Dr. Jekyll. Prodigium. And you were the highest bidder this morning at the auction, weren't you? Well, I'm sorry, but if you're looking for the location of Amsher, I don't have it. The scroll disintegrated, and I can't read hieroglyphics, so... I don't need to know where Amsher is. I've been there many times. I merely wanted the scroll so I could destroy it and ensure nobody else ever finds it. I'm here to thank you for doing the job for me and saving Prodigium tens of millions in the process. Well, I accept Venmo. Venmo. Yes, Venmo. It's something we have here on Earth. Although, for all I know, on your planet, Venmo could be your mother's name. Indrid. Cold is not amused. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm sure. Speaking of, we have got to get you some new clothes, man. I'll be honest, I don't know any tailors, but I can recommend some good t-shirt brands. A nice cotton blend will change your life, I'm telling you. It's okay to be comfortable on the job. I take it, then, that you know who I am. I know that Henry didn't trust you. I know that he died on the floor of your facility after you cut him off from the only drug that kept him sane. And I know that you couldn't have possibly known where I was so quickly, and that you definitely didn't make the trip just to thank me for stealing from you. So why don't we cut to the chase before your dress shirt chokes you out, because I really don't know if my powers work on Martians. Indrid takes a seat across from Nick and tries to play it casual as he unbuttons his collar. Why do you want to find Amsher, Mr. Morton? Let's skip the questions we both know the answers to. Did you get what you were looking for from the scroll? I got a name and a location. That was all I needed. No, no. See, that's what I've come to tell you. You'll need more, Mr. Morton. A lot more. You see, the Golden Pyramid of Amsher sank into the earth almost 100 years ago. It lies over 1,000 feet underground, inaccessible to all. And trust me, I've tried. You would need a team of 1,000 men to excavate it and the budget of a small country. I'm afraid if you want to rid yourself of the god of death once and for all, you'll need to find another alternative. I think we both know the alternative that Prodigium has wanted for me from the beginning. So, are you here to kill me, Indrid? Don't be crude, Mr. Morton. I'm here as a professional courtesy. You did me the favor of solving my vampire problem. Which you never thanked me for, by the way. As I said, I'm on Venmo. And I'm doing you the favor of saving your life. Stay away from Amsher. I can't do that. It's the only way left. I can find it because I have to find it. You and what army? I'm sorry, but even your legion of evil with all of your ghastly powers couldn't reach it in one piece. It's the Dark Legion. And there's nothing my team can't do when we're together. And are you together? I can't help but notice it's just you here in Japan. Nick has no response to this. I see. Best of luck, Mr. Morton. He stands to leave. Before he does, he leaves Mr. Morton with one last comment. However you end up ridding yourself of Set, make sure he is destroyed. I'm leaving you alive as a favor to our mutual friend Dr. Jekyll, and as repayment for Dracula. But if you loose that god upon this world, I cannot promise I will be so kind. Nick is left alone, chewing on Indrid's words. Finally, he pulls out his cell phone and opens up the contact for Dr. Jenny Halsey. He hesitates, but then calls. He apologizes for not being in touch for so long and asks if they can meet. Nick flies back to America and visits Jenny, played by Annabelle Wallace, at her home with Carol in Portland, Oregon. Due to budget and scheduling reasons, we will not see Darcy Carden as Carol Lemley in this movie. (laughs) Jenny greets Nick warmly, and they catch up in her living room. It's the first time they've seen each other since House of Dracula, and things are a bit awkward considering how different each of their lives are now than when they first met in the 2017 Mummy. Jenny talks about doing some local paranormal research with Carol in town, but mentions that she's actually starting to miss their adventuring and monster fighting days. Actually, that's sort of what I wanted to talk to you about. 
Oh? Jenny takes a sip of coffee, and Nick notices the ring on her finger. Wait, are you and Carol? Oh, oh my gosh, yes. I forgot I hadn't told you. I tried calling when it happened, but, well, you know, you've been tough to get a hold of. Wow, that's... I, I mean, congratulations. Things are moving quickly, huh? What has it been, six months? Yes, well, it turns out Carol is very traditional. Catholic? You hold lesbian. I don't know what that means. Of course you don't. Jenny invites Nick to the wedding, but Nick says he shouldn't commit yet. He's got something he needs to take care of first, and until it's done, it might not be safe to be around him. He shows her the bandages on his hands. Oh my god, Nick, what happened? Nick takes off his hoodie and reveals that the bandages go all the way up to his elbows now. He peels them off, and we see that he still has the holes in his palms from where Jenny shot the eyes of Osiris out of them in the House of Dracula. His flesh everywhere is now black, cracked, and rotting. Jenny makes a face at the smell. Nick explains that since Set and Osiris were mortal enemies, Set is furious with Nick for welcoming Osiris into their body and is now slowly killing him. Every time he uses his powers, or rather, whenever Set lets him use his powers, the cancer spreads further. If he doesn't finally rid himself of this curse soon, he'll die. I'll pack a bag. Carol will be home in a few hours and we can fill her in. She'll understand. No, Jenny. No. You stay here. You have a life with Carol now, and I don't know if this is a mission I'm coming back from. Nick, if you need my help, I'm there. You know that. I know. And I appreciate that. But I've got a whole team all ready to go, and trust me, these guys put us to shame. Uh, I just stopped by to check in before I, you know, drop off the grid again for a while. Jenny seems concerned, but they say their goodbyes and Nick heads out. He gets in the car and closes his eyes. He was really hoping Jenny would be the one to go with him, but once again, he's on his own. He grimaces, pulls out his phone, and makes one last desperate call. Hi, yes, is this Quince Brockmore's number? Yes, Quince. It's me, Nick Morton. No, no, I I survived that plane crash. Dumb luck, I guess. Hey, look, I've got an urgent job that needs doing in Sudan. The biggest treasure of them all, I swear to God. Look, I'll be in Oswan tomorrow night. Just put a team together for me and I'll explain the whole thing. Don't worry, Quince. This one's going to be big enough to pay you back tenfold for what I owe you. He hangs up with a sigh and says quietly, I could really use you right now, Jack. There's no response, so he drives off. We cut to the airport, packed to the gills with travelers. Nick is flying to Oswan in Egypt, and from there he'll travel to Sudan. A shot of a departure screen shows dozens of canceled flights, and once again Nick is swimming through crowds. He waits in a packed security line, he sits on the floor waiting to board, he gets jostled while finding his seat. All throughout, we can see the stress in his body. He sits in coach, the flight packed and noisy, and nervously jostles his leg in his seat. Then he looks at the seat next to him. It's empty, but something about the way the leather is pressed... It's almost like there's somebody there. He reaches out slowly, preparing for his hand to be stopped in midair by some invisible force. But no, his hand goes right down to the cushion. He lets out a nervous laugh before a heavy backpack drops into the seat and a voice says, I think that's my seat. Nick jumps back, startled, and the woman, Kat, played by Elizabeth Mitchell, apologizes. Oh oh my God, are you okay? I didn't mean to scare you. She takes her seat as Nick shakes things off. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm a bit jumpy. Scared of flying? No, flying's great. I've jumped out of more planes than I can count. It's the crowds. I get really claustrophobic. You a skydiver? Military. It's funny, I did two tours and have faced down enemies you truly would not believe. And yet I could never even get through seven minutes in heaven without running out of the closet screaming my head off. They get settled in their seats and Kat offers him something from her bag. Zan? I'm sorry? Xanax. You look like you could use one. Yes, actually, that sounds perfect. He pops the pill and starts to relax. He has some more banter with Kat, and things get a bit flirty. Kat even tells him to look her up if he ends up with a spare evening in Egypt. Eventually, Nick gets drowsy and nods off. He falls into a nightmare. In the nightmare, he's back in Osiris' tomb, where he was transformed into the living mummy by Dracula. He looks down and sees that instead of transforming, something is bursting out from inside of him. His skin sheds off like bandages, revealing the dark god's set underneath. 
Set reaches forward and grabs something invisible in his hands. When he pulls them apart, there's an explosion of blood as Jack Griffin, the invisible man, is ripped to shreds. Jenny's voice floats in. I'm sorry, Nick. This is for your own good. He's in a sarcophagus now, back as himself. Jenny stands above him, slowly sliding the top closed. Nick tries to fight, but he's wrapped in bandages. The last sliver of light disappears over his face as he screams. Back in reality, Nick is shaking in his sleep and muttering, No, no. Cat looks concerned and shakes him awake. Nick, Nick, it's okay, wake up. Nick's eyes pop open, revealing the double irises. He turns to Cat, his face distorted into its demon twin, teeth sharp, and he screams into her face, Leave me alone! Cat stands up into the aisle, terrified. She asks a flight attendant for a new seat as Nick realizes what has happened. He tries to apologize, but she's gone. In Oswan, Nick walks into yet another hotel room, weary and alone. He empties his pockets on the bedside table and notices the card with Cat's number on it. He crumples it up and throws it away. The next morning, he gathers his gear for the last leg of his trip. Before he walks out the door, he stops and looks over his shoulder. I know you're not here. But if you are, somehow, if you've been following me, I need help, Jack. I don't think I can do this by myself. And I know you can't trust me, and I know I'm the last person who should be asking you for a favor, but I could just really use a friend right now. That's all. He waits another moment, then sighs and heads out the door. As he closes it behind him, a stack of papers on the desk ruffle. Is it from the breeze of the closing door, or someone standing up from the chair at the desk? Nick heads to an airstrip to meet up with Quince, who has a private plane ready to take off. On board are a group of ex-military grunts decked out in gear. Before they take off, Quince demands to know what the score is. Nick says, Ever hear the Golden Pyramid of Am Sher? Quince is stunned. He thinks Nick is crazy. That place and its unfathomable treasure are just a myth. Nick says it's not going to be easy to get to, but he knows the exact coordinates. It's in Sudan, an area that was formerly the Upper Kingdom of Egypt. They set off, and Nick attempts to make pleasantries with the men, many of whom he knows from his old days as a thief. They don't return his kindness. They land at a nearby airstrip and take a jeep towards the coordinates, but instead of finding an empty desert with perhaps an enormous sinkhole in it, they find that in the years since Am Sher supposedly sunk, a bustling market has sprung up in its place. Nick is shocked, and Quince and his men are skeptical. Nick reassures him it's definitely underneath them, they just have to find a cave entrance somewhere. Quince nods and looks around at his men. Roger that, Nick. I think we can handle that bit without you. One of the men comes up behind Nick and zip-ties his wrists behind his back and puts a black bag over his head. Hey, hey, Quince, what the hell is going on here? Quince tells Nick that he really had some nerve calling him up and asking for favors. Turns out Nick has cheated every single one of the men in attendance, Quince included. He's shortchanged them on jobs, stolen artifacts from them. And you remember Vic over there, yeah? Vic grunts. Hello, Vic. You broke my sister's heart, Nick! And I'm sorry about that, really. She's a lovely girl. You're not the one who had to comfort her that night. Melanie deserved better. Quince tells Nick that to make things even, they're cutting him out of this score. And when they're done, the Sudanese police can decide what to do with him. Nick says, I'm sorry, Quince, but that's not going to work for me. See, you're not the only date I'm bringing to this dance. I got someone waiting for me in the Golden Pyramid. Nick spreads his hands behind him and the ground begins to shake. What can I say? I'm a heartbreaker. The entire market is suddenly engulfed in a sandstorm. Nick drops to one knee, clearly in pain at what this effort has cost him. He shakes off the bag on his head and sees the market in chaos. His captors shield their faces and Nick springs into action, fighting them off, breaking out of the zip ties, and fleeing into the market. We get another chase scene through dense crowds of people, with Nick and the goons running upstream from the locals fleeing for shelter. Eventually, Nick comes out the other side of the market and into an open expanse of desert. The sandstorm is raging fiercer than ever, and Nick stumbles his way forward before stopping suddenly. He's teetering on the edge of a vast hole in the earth surrounded by rock. He pulls himself back from the edge and tries to peer down. The blackness seems to go on forever. This is the way under he's been looking for. He rushes to stake a rope into the ground so he can rappel down. He gets the gear set up as the sandstorm fades and lowers himself slowly into the pit. 
He rappels down slowly, not sure what awaits him below or how deep this cave goes. He's only gone about 20 feet down when the sun is blocked out. He looks up to see Quince standing above him at the rim of the cave. The other grunts sidle up next to him, looking worse for wear and pissed off. Quince calls down. Know what, Nick? You can keep this one. He reaches down and grabs the rope with one hand and a knife in the other. No, 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 wait, Quince, let's talk. Quince cuts the rope and Nick falls. He falls and falls until the cave entrance is a small pinprick above him. It seems like he'll fall forever in the darkness until something skids along his side. The walls of the pit are slowly getting closer together, causing Nick to roll down them, still almost vertical. But every jutting rock jabs into his ribs and elbows and legs, and he scrambles to grab something, but he's falling too fast. It doesn't help that the walls are covered in water, rushing down the rock face alongside Nick. It becomes clear that this pit is narrowing into a conical shape, and eventually Nick is able to reach out to the opposite wall and slow his fall a bit, just as he lands butt first in the rounded point of the cone. It's so dark we can hardly see anything, just faint reflections of the extremely distant sunlight glinting off the falling water. Nick lights a flare and looks around him. He's caught at the bottom of a stone prison, the walls reaching up endlessly around him. He looks under his butt and sees that this cone ends in a hole just about as wide as his body. All the water rushes through the hole and falls even farther down into more blackness. He wedges his feet on the walls on either side of the hole and stands, attempting to climb up, but the rock is impossibly slippery. He can't even begin to get a grip. With no other options, he looks down into the hole below him. He shines the flare down, but there's nothing but blackness below and the sound of dripping water. He drops the flare into the hole and after a moment, hears it splash into something below. It sounds like a long ways down, but not a fatal distance. Besides, he's supposed to be indestructible, right? He holds his arms out to his sides to brace himself and slowly lowers his legs through the hole. He's able to worm himself down to his chest, but his shoulders are too wide to fit through. He panics for a moment, thinking he's stuck, but then lifts one arm straight up and pushes the other one down against his side. As soon as he does that, he falls straight down. He lands in a large pool of water below, only about six inches deep, and his right ankle bends unnaturally under his weight with a crack. He cries out and collapses in the water. He hastily grabs the flare from where it landed near him and holds it above him. He is alone in an enormous underground cavern lined with stalactites and stalagmites like teeth, pools of water pocking the stone ground, and no visible way out. End of Act One. All right. I I like first and foremost that off the bat, this feels more like a horror movie than some of our previous installments. And it's only going to get actually more. Well, more, yeah, he's, I think just this tumbled was into an action abyss. Act. <laughs> yes. I mean, we have these two chase scenes, which I think maybe mm-hmm. we would need to distinguish from each other a little bit more because we have two like sort of chases through through tight yeah. crowds. But I also like to give established a sort of theme that one of the things that scares him is tight spaces is claustrophobia. So this may be a, a sense of that we have a sort of a rehearsals for something, and now he's going to be trapped in a confined space himself. Yes. So, uh, I, I like that you were really insistent that when the house, when House of Dracula ended, we wanted to leave everybody in a worse place. Yes. Which is immediately paying dividends because so often when you're doing the sequel to a movie, you have to set the status quo of, hey, everything is fine now because, you know, we had the happy ending at the end of the previous film. And then spend the first act, like, destroying that status quo and establishing, like, a new problem. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we're starting from a place of, uh, everything's kind of already a mess. Like he's got, we can see that certain things have progressed. He's gained some more mastery of of his skills. He has a goal. He knows where he's headed. But, Mm -hmm. and and for the most part, things are worse now, right? Yeah. We have, his body is deteriorating. Uh, He's, he's got maybe an expiration date now. Like his powers are killing him. Mm -hmm. He was, he was, he's more alone than he's been at any point in this series so far. Yeah, so my when I when I was approaching this, um, first of all, from like a sequel standpoint, I knew that coming out of House of Dracula, where I wanted to take Nick was he had spent all of House of Dracula basically not thinking he could be a leader of a group of people. He get then becomes that leader, but then all the people disappear. So I wanted this to be a movie about Nick being alone. Mm-hmm. That now his he's got odds that are higher than ever. He's got this ticking clock of set k- killing him, uh, but he has nobody with him. And to follow up from the Mummy, you know the promise of the end of the Mummy is that he's going to be searching for a cure to the cur- curse. 
we've pretty much wrapped up a lot of other character arcs and things from the mummy. So that was really the thing to follow up on was, okay, well, let's, let's now continue that. The problem I had when thinking about a mummy movie is I don't really get scared by mummy movies, right? And so whenever that's the case, I like to look at all of the various tropes and think, okay, what is something in here that actually scares me that I could then blow up and extrapolate? And for me with The Mummy, it's claustrophobia. It's a lot of underground tombs and, you know, uh, fragile spaces and stuff. And uh, the claustrophobia is scary. I'm claustrophobic myself. Um, And it struck me that that really fits with the theme for Nick of, like, being alone. And uh, if I could tie those two things together, um, that was kind of going to be the main thrust of my movie was that sort of uh, both literal and uh, metaphorical claustrophobia. I noticed that like as I'm I'm kind of projecting a little bit, uh, I guess, from what I've re- read towards the top of the page, a very small cast list. Very small cast. I'm list. imagining that he might be spending a lot of act two by himself. Act two is where I'm going to play my hand. Uh, basically, act one is all is is not what the rest of the movie is going to be but like what i really wanted to do in act one um was put him in around as many people as possible Uh uh, as a contrast to where he's going to be in act two um but show that he's alone in these crowds that there's all these crowds but he's still by himself and i also wanted to show all the ways in which he's been cut off from people whether it's jack because jack got hurt because of him and so now jack wants nothing to do with him he had he like sort of makes friends with like margie and carson or cat on the plane but they're scared off by this, by set inside right. of him. And like there's he, sort of, like, I can see, like, an idea of, like, a, an anxiety that's a relatable anxiety, the idea you meet somebody and you hit it off and you think it's just a matter of time before they meet the real me and they won't want to be my friend anymore. Exactly. Uh, I think that that's a really, uh, I think it's a, a good emotional anchor to give it. I also really like what you're doing with Jack because I don't remember how much we talked about it on the air and how much we want to talk about it on the air, but I know that we had the idea of we don't have like an Invisible Man movie on our slate, right? Not for Act 2, but, for Phase, for, two, for phase yeah. 2. And so the idea of being like, uh, if you had an invisible person in your life, then that would mean different things to you based on your relationship with that person. But mm-hmm. everyone might be like, in the, in the case in the case of Nick, the, the issue is that like he was alone and doesn't want to be. So there's sort of this fantasy of the idea that his yeah. friend is still with him. He's just this anchor that he's like talking to, even though he knows he's not there. Yeah, yeah. Because even the idea that if Jack was there, was giving him the silent treatment, but was at least still there, that would be better than really being alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, because then at least there's somebody that in a pinch she trusts that something good would happen. But yeah. but it seems like, uh, and I really like. I think that particularly if we were when when we film this, like the idea of those visual things, like the like the seat cushion. I really like this idea, and I like playing with his absence throughout phase two. Yeah, I I, I really wanted to play with that because again, he's invisible, um, and. You know, also even just like the thieves at the end, like, so then Nick, you know, tries to surround himself with more people he thinks can help him, but it's his past catching up with him because he was an asshole. He was a thief and he cheated all these people. And so all the people from his past won't help him. Mm -hmm. The people he's meeting in the present, he's too dangerous to be around. And all of his Dark Legion buddies are either scared off by what happened or Jenny is started a new life without him, you know? And he's, she's willing to help, but he's like, at this point, I think maybe thinking of there's this thing that happens sometimes when you isolate yourself, where you where you start to wonder. I think that maybe he's dealing with like the fear that he's like a toxic person, mm-hmm. right? He's he's alone, doesn't want to be alone. But I think if you are alone, you have to examine. Okay, like what is it about me? Is it a bad idea? Should mm-hmm. I be alone? Should yeah. I be by myself? Right? Is it dangerous to be around me? And for him, he has like a physical manifestation of that in mm-hmm. that you know good horror movie way, where it's like, no, it actually is dangerous to be around him. Yeah. Right. And there are people who can handle it, and he doesn't want to put them through it. Mm-hmm. I think you've established the emotional stakes in the movie very yes. well, and that you've joined them with the um, joined them with the horror elements and the physical stakes of the movie well. The other thing I'll say about the claustrophobia element, now we've we've done a lot of the character claustrophobia. Uh, as you said, like now he's actually alone. I want to see Tom Cruise in tight spaces. <laughs> we've seen Tom Cruise jump off cliffs and out of airplanes. And like, he's clearly a big action guy. It just seemed like uh, different types of stunt work for Tom Cruise to do as we're going to see in act two that I would really like to see him in. Yeah, that's that would a creative be idea. new for him. All right, um, we want to dive into act two? Let's jump in act two, which is, like I said, this is going to be where the movie becomes what 
it is. <laughs> um, and uh, we will probably have a lot more to talk about after this act. Act two. Nick turns his attention to his ankle. He tries to rotate it and cries out in pain. He extends his hands towards it, willing set to heal the fracture, but nothing happens. Not now, you bastard, come on! But set is nowhere to be found. Nick instead resorts to mortal first aid, wrapping his ankle in gauze and using a metal ground stake from his gear bag as a splint. The red light from the flare finally goes out, leaving him in absolute pitch blackness. He removes an LED headlamp from his bag and climbs awkwardly to his feet to scan the empty cavern with the thin strand of light. The next 20 or so minutes will be completely silent. No music. The only sounds will be the low ambient noise of the caves, water constantly trickling, and just barely audible, the sound of Nick's heartbeat in his chest. The only lighting will come from his headlamp and its reflections on the rocks, illuminating only slivers of the screen at a time. The cave is as large as a ballroom, with offshoots opening up in all directions around him. There's nothing to suggest that any other human has ever been here. This isn't an Egyptian burial site with hieroglyphics. There's no cave drawings, not even discarded climbing gear from previous explorers. He follows the first opening he comes to, but the cave quickly begins to shrink until he's crouching his way forward. His claustrophobia gets the better of him, and he hurries back out of the cave. He comes up with a better idea. He digs in his bag for a lighter and holds the flame up in the middle of the cave. A breeze so gentle it can't be felt bends the flame in the direction of another offshoot. He gathers his belongings and his courage and heads that way. He continues this way all day, making his way through pitch black narrow caverns until he gets to forks in the tunnel, at which point he uses his lighter to point the way. Each time he makes a choice, he takes out a metal stake and hammer and chisels a mark into the stone of the path he just came out of so he can follow his way back if he needs to. Eventually his ankle gives out and he decides to camp in an open cavern, chewing hungrily at a protein bar in his bag before falling asleep. He awakes in the darkness an unknown time later and continues on. He gets to a point with two branching tunnels and the lighter tells him to take the one on his left. He turns around to chisel his mark where he's been, but the stake slips and hits a crack between two stones. Some pebbles fall, which loosen some larger rocks, which leads to a rumbling, and suddenly boulders are falling. Nick staggers back against the wall, and when the dust settles, the tunnel he just came through is blocked off, as is the one he was supposed to go down next. Cornered, he takes the cave on the right instead, not knowing if it even leads anywhere at all, or if he's trapped for good. The cave starts out comfortably enough, although it's descending even deeper into the earth instead of taking Nick up and towards the surface. Nick takes the steep steps down with winces of pain as he tries to keep off his ankle. The camera faces him as he descends, everything behind him just empty blackness as he climbs further into the unknown. His face looks different than any Tom Cruise we've ever seen on screen. Dirty, haggard, hollow, and terrified. The cave begins to narrow and Nick's pulse quickens. It's only as wide as him now, and the steps down are getting steeper, until he's basically hopping down shafts he can barely fit through. He couldn't go back now even if he wanted, but there's no guarantee that he'll even be able to continue going forward if it keeps narrowing. He continues to contort his body around sharp drops and low ceiling flat passages. After what feels like forever, just as the ankle pain is almost too much to bear, the tunnel flattens out, even if it doesn't get wider. He pushes the rest of the way through and finally emerges in a long chamber, about five feet wide. But he's not alone. The cave is lined with mummies. Not ancient Egyptian mummies. At least, there's no signs of ritual burying or other Egyptian signifiers. Just two dozen bodies with papery skin and faces permanently frozen in grimaces of horror. For background, some cave climates can actually lead to a sort of natural mummification of corpses. The most famous of these are the mummies of Guanajuato, cholera victims whose bodies were found mummified and who were featured in the opening of Werner Herzog's Nosferatu the Vampire, if you want to see some really <laughs> scary-looking fucking corpses. Their bodies are standing in regular intervals, leaning against the walls of the tunnel. Nick examines them, but there's no sign of how old they may be or who arranged them like this. He walks down the line, wary of their watchful gaze, until he hits the end of the tunnel. Against the far wall, two more mummies stand facing him, flanking... Well, to call it another passage would be generous. It's more like a crack in the flat stone wall, less than a foot wide, starting at the floor and extending higher than the light from Nick's headlamp can reach. Nick takes one look at it and shakes his head. Nope, nuh-uh. 
and paces back down the tunnel, searching for another passage he knows doesn't exist. As his heartbeat gets subtly louder, he cautiously approaches the crevice again and steals himself. He takes a deep breath and tries to slide in sideways, but his chest won't fit. He closes his eyes and exhales all of the air from his lungs, flattening himself thin enough to scrape inside. Fuck, this is really tense. <laughs> I'm breaking things up here. It's a podcast. No, that, that's good. <laughs> I, I tweeted that there were parts of this that I got, I freaked myself out writing. And as someone who is claustrophobic, you can see why. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at this particular scene in my head. I'm kind of seeing the sort of sideways angle of it and the mm-hmm. and the the kind of narrow column of light in the middle. And just the idea is... One of the movies I watched for research for this was The Descent. Oh, I love The Descent. Mm-hmm. All right, let's let you get back into it. He inches forward. He can't turn his head. He can't raise his arms. His breathing is fast and shallow, unable to take a full breath because his rib cage doesn't have room to expand. The tunnel stretches on and on, and we really milk this for time. His heart rate is slowly getting faster and faster, and every time we think he must be getting to the end, it goes on even longer. Nick starts to panic, hyperventilating and wheezing, his heart racing loudly in our ears. He stops moving forward, and his eyes start to roll up. He's passing out, his body giving out from lack of oxygen. Just before he faints for good, a loud screech snaps him out of it. He points the headlamp up, and we see that the walls of this crevice are just covered in bats. They scream towards the light, and suddenly dozens of them are fleeing the tunnel past Nick. But there's no room for them to go around him, so they all fight and scramble their way around his head, scratching and biting him and getting tangled in his hair. He can't shake his head or raise his hands to fight them off, so he has to just close his eyes and take it. When they're finally gone, his face is covered in blood from deep scratches all over, and a chunk of an ear is missing. Fucking bats. I can't get away from fucking bats. (laughs) He blinks the blood away and continues forward with renewed adrenaline, and finally he's free. Sort of. He's in an opening about as big as a walk-in closet, but with no ceiling in sight. There's also no tunnels, just stone walls all around him. No, 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 no. Fuck! Nick begins to panic again, screaming and pounding his fist on the walls, until he finally collapses to the ground. And that's when his headlamp finds it a small hole in the bottom of the wall, just barely big enough to crawl into. Nick shakes his head and rambles to himself, at his wit's end. But finally, he ties his gear bag to his ankle with a rope and goes for it. The tunnel is angled sharply downwards, so gravity helps propel him through, but also makes it hard for him to stop himself from going too fast and getting stuck. The tunnel is so narrow that the rocks scrape against his back and stomach, flattening him as he pulls himself forward with his arms. At one point, he grabs a rock to pull himself forward, but he can't move. His belt buckle has gotten snagged, and it's holding him in place. Again, his heart rate spikes and his eyes bulge. He pulls his arm back and is able to wriggle it around to his side. He pulls at the side of his belt to dislodge it, but it won't move. Then he remembers the Swiss Army knife in his pocket and manages to get that out. He cuts the belt and is able to pull it through the loops and off the rock. But the sudden loosening sends him falling forward and without both hands to stop him. He slides through the tight tunnel until friction brings him to a stop, with a mummified foot resting against his cheek. It's the body of another poor soul who must have died after getting stuck in this same tunnel. Luckily, the body is much thinner now, and Nick is able to get both hands in front of himself again, pushing the body along in front of him as he wriggles forward. Eventually, the tunnel takes another drop down at a sharper angle, and when Nick pushes the corpse through, it falls out of sight. Nick drops his head and torso down, but his legs won't go. They're stuck in the upper part of the turn, without enough room to angle down. He pulls with all his might, but he's not going anywhere. His headlamp falls off his head and lands far below, shining up into his face so he can see his panic fully. He's hanging down, the blood rushing to his head, and he finally goes into a full-blown panic attack. It looks like he's going insane, screaming himself hoarse and thrashing in the inches of space he has around him. He pounds his fists against the tunnel wall, and that's when we hear the rumbling. It's far away at first, but getting closer. The cave is collapsing behind him. He starts screaming for help, knowing that the closest help is miles above him on the surface. There's nothing left. He's gonna die. Can he die, even? Or will Set keep him alive in exactly this position for eternity? 
The rumbling grows louder and louder, and just before it reaches Nick, a hand reaches up from the tunnel below and grabs Nick's wrist, pulling him and twisting him down the tunnel. He lands on the other side in an open cavern, but the rocks in the collapsing tunnel land on his gear bag, so he's kind of hanging upside down by his ankle from the tunnel entrance. The cavern is filled with clouds of dust from the collapse, and through it all he can just barely make out a silhouette, upside down in his perspective. He coughs and deliriously mutters, Jack? Jack, is that you? But when the dust settles, it isn't Jack. It's a man named Rick O'Connell, played by Brendan Fraser, (laughs) who cuts Nick down and pulls him to rest against the wall. Okay, just give him a second. (laughs) I thought you might do this, Mm -hmm. right? But I love the way that you've done it and that you... There's always a problem when you're going to be playing with an element in a movie where some of the surprise is totally metatextual. It's just something that means something to the audience but doesn't mean something to the character. You need to find a way to make it, to make that moment feel earned for the character and for Mm -hmm. anybody in the audience who doesn't get the joke, right? Like one of my, one of my most frustrating moments in any like movie in recent memory and other movies have done it too is like in Star Trek Into Darkness when when Benedict comes back just like, my name is Khan. Mm -hmm. And like there's this beat but that doesn't mean anything to the people who are watching. That beat just exists for you, the audience, to be like, I knew it. I knew the marketing lied to me and he was playing Khan. <laughs> or, you know, like those long, or those like long spaces when each of the older Spider-Man shows up in No Way Home. That's yeah. just for audience response, right? Yeah. Um, you have created the moment. The fact that he finds anyone is such a relief in this moment when there's mm-hmm. all this tension that even if you don't know who that is, if you're him or if you're just invested in his well-being, you're going to cheer because someone's come to his rescue. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to matter that it's Brendan fucking Fraser playing Rick O'Connell, the character whose name doesn't matter because he's Brendan Fraser. <laughs> um, and uh, now I got to know how you're, how you're working that out because I have to assume because it's just the fucking timetable. It's not oh not the same Rick O'Connell. From we'll, the, well, we'll get there. We'll get into it. The other thing but I want to do What a relief that's going to fucking be. The other thing I wanted to do here is sort of, I wanted to do an inverse kind of fake out from the Invisible Man. Uh huh. Because yeah, the Invisible Man, remember, we had the surprise reveal of Nick Morton uh-huh. uh, at about this point in the movie, and he makes this similar in a dark entrance. You know, Nick Morton appears. I kind of want, especially with all the Jack stuff earlier, I want people to think maybe it actually is Jack, that we're yes. reversing it, and Jack will appear, and that the ruffling papers or something, maybe we're setting up a return of Jack in this movie. But instead, we fake you out, and it's not Jack, even if that's who even Nick thinks it is. Uh And it's someone even bigger. It's the return of Brendan Fraser as Rick O'Connell. I think that's great. I think I think you've really well. Also, want to say I really think like I'm very grateful that I watched his house last night before coming here to record this. I can really see the idea of um, the way that he plays with an environment um Mm -hmm. and is willing to play with the realism of an environment and get expressionistic with it i think is a great match and i'm i'd be excited to see what he does with this with that whole sequence while we're uh kind of stopped why don't we go to a break real quick uh we're gonna hear a quick little ad uh since this is a nice little cliffhanger to leave off on and when we come back we'll figure out what the hell rick o'connell is doing in this tunnel and who exactly he is we'll be right back Hey there, I'm David. I'm Tess. I'm Giovanni. And I'm Greg. And we're Left Trigger, Right Trigger, your video game book club. Each episode, we pick a topic, and each of us brings a video game that we think best fits that topic. Tune into the show to find out how Super Mario Land is all about travel. Or how Bloodborne is a game about sacrifice. Or how SimCity is actually a conspiracy to mine data about human infrastructure. No, we have to stop. We're we're doing a pro, it's a promo, please stop. Intrigued? A little scared? Us too. Make sure to catch us every other Tuesday on your favorite Podcatcher app. See you there. Welcome back to Are You Afraid of the Dark Universe? The Mummy Returns. Uh, we and are who gonna... the fuck has returned? It's Brendan Fraser. <laughs> not a mummy, though. So no, uh, I guess not he's so not far the mummy we returning. We're going to jump right back in with Act 2, where we left off. Uh, Nick has just survived a cave collapse. Uh, and was saved by Rick O'Connell, played by Brennan Fraser. He cuts Nick down and puts him to rest against the wall. Rick gives him water from a stone bowl and sits while Nick calms down. Rick is ragged with long, unruly hair and a beard. His clothes are filthy and torn. Once it seems like Nick has regained his sanity, Rick asks, So who the hell are you? Nick. Rick. Rick. 
Are you real? <sighs> yes, I am. I'm sorry to say this is a nightmare neither of us are waking up from. Drink up, catch your breath, then we can step into my office. The two of them walk through a much more comfortable tunnel towards the cavern that Rick calls home. How long have you been down here? Well, that depends on what year it is up there. 2023. Rick stops and looks back at Nick, dismayed. Only that long? Well, I, I guess it would make it about 60 years then. That's not possible. You can't be that old. Oh, I'm much older. Believe it or not, I was born in 1902. How the hell are you still sane? What makes you think that I am? Can you tell me the way out of here? Oh, there's no way out. I'm sorry, pal, but we're sealed under a thousand feet of solid stone. I've searched every inch of this place ten times over with more desperation than your young soul can imagine. He claps Nick on the back. Good to have a friend now, though, isn't it? They settle into Rick's cavern, and Rick starts a fire. So, what brought you down here? You a treasure hunter? A thief? If so, you're hardier than most of those that try it, I'll give you that. I'm looking for someone. Well, there's only one scarecrow in this cornfield, and that's me, so congratulations. I'm looking for Emotep. Rick's face darkens, and he looks at Nick sternly. I'm afraid you wasted a trip, Nick, because I can't let that happen. Why is that? Because I am the last of the Magi, and keeping people away from Imhotep is the sole reason I'm down here. The hell is a Magi? Rick sighs and begins his tale. For those listeners unfamiliar, like Nick, the Magi were the bodyguards of Pharaoh Seti I. This is all told in the opening of The Mummy, 1999. Imhotep was the Pharaoh's high priest, who was caught having an affair with the Pharaoh's mistress, Anaxunamun. Imhotep was cursed with the Hamdai and mummified alive, and all of the descendants of the Magi were tasked with keeping him dead and buried. They failed, and Imhotep was resurrected twice, with Rick putting a stop to it both times. The second time, Rick discovered he was a Magi himself, but refused to join up with them. And then... We flash back to 1959. In a voiceover, Rick tells us that agents of some organization called Prodigium came to Egypt to confiscate numerous sacred and powerful artifacts. They were met by the Medjai, led by Ardeth Bey, played once again by Oded Fair. Prodigium claimed they were all on the same side, and that they wanted the artifacts to protect them from a wave of evil that would soon spread across the globe. But the Medjai didn't trust them, and would not let the artifacts be removed from their resting sites. The conflict escalated. We see the Medjai lined up on horseback at the crest of a dune. The forces of Prodigium attack with impossibly advanced weapons, some of which fire silver wisps of energy that instantly decay the part of the body they hit by a thousand years. Other weapons mutate the Magi into beasts that turn on their compatriots before collapsing under the weight of their sudden transformation. The leader of the Prodigium strike team and Ardeth charge at each other, Ardeth with his sword and the strike leader with some sort of energy baton. Ardeth defends himself admirably, but the strike leader doesn't play fair. The baton has a cannon in its handle, and he takes aim at Ardeth from afar. Another Magi member, Masked, sees this and runs to block the shot. Rick says in voiceover, The full ranks of the Magi were there that day to defend Emsher. Everyone except me. The cannon blast rips through the masked Magi member's torso and hits Ardeth behind him, mortally wounding both of them. Including my son, Alex. The masked Magi member crawls to Ardeth and takes off his covering. It's Alex O'Connell played once again by Luke Ford from The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. (laughs) The rest of the Magi are dead in the sand. The strike leader stands over them and aims a weapon at their heads, and we cut to black. That night, I fell asleep in London, unaware of what had happened. And when I woke up the next morning, I was here. And I've been here ever since. Wait, if you woke up down here, how do you know any of this happened? Oh, they told me. Rick points to two skeletons lying near them. I woke up face to face with the corpses of my friend and my son. Their spirits spoke to me, told me that I'm the last of my kind. Now it's my duty to guard the last resting place of Imhotep until the end of time, unable to die unless by Imhotep's hands. He reaches out and softly rubs his thumb over the cheek of Alex's skull. They still talk to me sometimes. I don't know how, and maybe I've just gone insane, but I think it's really them. Death is but a doorway. What did you say? Oh, it's just something up. A friend of mine used to say, death is but a doorway. That's similar to something Imhotep used to say. Death is only the beginning. Well, it seems like we both know how true that is. Rick asks Nick to explain his deal and how he got down there. Nick tells him his story about Amonet and becoming the vessel for Set, the god of death. He also tells him about the Dark Legion and how they defeated Dracula. Wait, like 
the Dracula? Yeah. Wow, I'm impressed. Nice to meet a peer in the industry. Well, I didn't do it alone. Wait, yeah, you're telling me you had an immortal undead brute, two werewolves, and a handful of monster fighting experts on your team. So what exactly was your role there? I mean, I get it. You can bring people back from the dead, but they don't usually make the medic team leader. I'm not just the medic. You know, I'm sort of the team's resident mummy. Rick looks at him skeptically. You're, you're a mummy? Yeah, that's right. Cursed by Set himself. Have you ever been mummified? Well, no, but there was this ceremonial dagger. You're not a mummy. Okay, wait. You're possessed. You're not a mummy. Because first of all, if you were really a mummy, I'd have to kill you. That's just what I do. So don't go claiming you're a mummy just because you have bandage powers. It's, it's a shorthand. You know, there's no specific term for someone with an ancient Egyptian curse on them who hasn't been mummified. Accuracy is important, is all I'm saying. Hey, wait, if you have magic bandage powers, why is your ankle still messed up? Nick explains that Set has gone silent ever since he landed in the cave. While it was already getting harder to use them anyway, now Set is gone completely. Not surprising. Amotep's powers didn't work here either. Anubis robbed him of them so he could fight the Scorpion King as a mortal. The Scorpion King? Seriously, do not worry about it. Wait, but that's perfect. If Emotep is powerless here, then we can resurrect him temporarily without him growing too powerful. Okay, slow down. First of all, no, not gonna happen. Second, what does Imhotep have to do with any of this? Nick tells Rick about the breakthrough he had on his journey to learn more about Set's curse. By the way, I'm gonna pause here and say, Amshir is the oasis that they go to in The Mummy Returns 2001. So what okay. he's been hunting for this whole time, which was had the Golden Pyramid, which is where they have the Scorpion King showdown, at the end it sinks into the earth. Okay, I appreciate that because I have not seen The Mummy Returns in a while. I rewatched yes. the, the 99 Mummy recently. They're all on Hulu right now. I'm going to check them all out. I know you have the 4Ks. But <laughs> I do. I made all the lore add up. <laughs> yes. I, I did all my timelines. And I want to talk about your motivations for that in a bit. Yes. But I know we have to, we got to keep rolling. We got to keep rolling. So uh, Nick tells Rick about the breakthrough he had on his journey to learn more about Set's curse. Apparently, when it was discovered that Amonet, that's the 2017 mummy, killed the pharaoh, his wife, and his child, there was only one priest that was able to perform the necessary rituals to seal her and Set away for good. A young man by the name of Imhotep, not yet high priest of Egypt. He was the one who mummified her alive and sealed her away. The next pharaoh, Seti I, then rewarded Imhotep by making him high priest, until he would ironically also end up mummified alive. This makes Imhotep the only man who has ever lived who has successfully banished Set. Nick believes that he is his only hope in ridding himself of the god of death for good. Nick learned that Amsher was the last known resting place of Imhotep after he was banished to the underworld by an unknown adventurer. That would be moi. Thank you very much. But Rick is unconvinced and tells him that he won't let Nick revive Imhotep. Besides, Nick is trying to solve a problem that's already resolved itself. As long as he's in the cave, Set is gone, and there's no way for Nick to ever leave the cave. The end. Nick, obviously, will not take this for an answer. He gathers his things and hops painfully to his feet, thanking Rick for the save, but saying that he'll make the rest of the journey with or without his help. Rick lets him walk off into the darkness, then shouts, Hey, you need a light? Nick stops and pauses before giving a defiant, No. Rick sighs and gets wearily to his feet. <sighs> I'm coming with you. Now why would you do that? Because there's no way in hell you could get there alive by yourself. But just in case you do, I need to be there to kill you. And so the two of them set off. There will be some further adventures here, but I'm going to skim by them a bit for the sake of time. Because I'm being so... <laughs> yeah, you've, been, <laughs> you've been so terse up yes, to this, yeah, yeah. At this point. Uh, basically, there's a lot more dangerous and tight caving, but it's clear that it's much easier with Rick by Nick's side. He's able to talk Nick down when he gets panicked and guides him through some tight spots. The main point here is that Nick and Rick are becoming friends and that things are much easier for Nick with a partner by his side. After a long day of hiking, the two of them step into a massive cavern and Nick looks up in wonder. They're looking at a full Egyptian pyramid built from solid gold. But when it fell into the earth in 1933, one side must have fallen in first and kind of faster because the whole pyramid is lying sideways. It's not entirely flat against the ground because the tip of the pyramid, which is made out of diamonds, has gotten stuck on a cliff face so that the tip breaks off a bit and the pyramid sits with its floor at about 75 degrees angles from the ground. The cavern is obviously big enough to contain it, making it by far the biggest underground cavern we've seen so far, and it's filled with dead trees and plant life from the oasis that got sucked under with the pyramid nearly a hundred years ago. Rick claps Nick on the back and says, Welcome, my friend, to the Golden Pyramid of Amsher. End of Act 2. Hey, fun stuff. 
Yes. Um, I think that it's interesting that we got this movie has been the the heaviest in a while. Uh, I would say since since Frankenstein, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, and then we really do get like a a pretty big swerve. Um, and not just in terms of hey, we're adding three previous movies to the canon. <laughs> I mean, I guess you can decide whether Tomb of the Dragon Emperor counts, but it's. Uh, at least two, and like it doesn't not fit into the can. You know, I just I can't cast Jet Li in anything. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I do have to interrogate because my mm-hmm. film critic brain is kind of is a little cynical about this whole move. Mm-hmm. Like, all right, you were talking about how uh, a while back about how the the Mummy twenty seventeen was just not what people wanted in part because it just didn't reward people's expectations about previous mummy movies. Yes. It doesn't work in the requel thing. And now you have turned the whole dark universe into a sort of requel of the mummy trilogy. I want to point out that I'm not actually inventing this whole cloth. Friend of the show, Ella Dawson, who uh, was in our dark Legion, as right, the voice Jenny of Jenny Halsey. Halsey. We were watching the 2017 mummy together. And actually she noticed that in the scene where Jenny is running through the library in prodigium, she throws a book down on the ground, and it is the Book of (laughs) Amun-Ra from the Mummy movies of 1999. So they actually did throw an Easter egg in, at least, to those films, implying that they could be canon. All right, but like that's the whole (laughs) thing where there's like, oh, it was kind of cool in Predator 2 that there was a xenomorph skull on on the Mm -hmm. wall. And the, the fun part for years was just people being like, yeah, it's kind of cool. It's like they're in the same universe. They made those video games and comics about it, and then they went and made... Okay, AVP is fine. But like the era of like the cute Easter egg and that being enough and that being fun is over now where mm-hmm. everything is like, you know, five looper articles, two of them written by me. And it's like <laughs> that kind of, I'm not saying this is a criticism against your script because I'm enjoying it. That kind of sucks mm-hmm. that nothing's allowed to just be a gag. Yes. Everything is lore. And yes. in your own words, it's horror, not lore mm-hmm. right? So I'm enjoying it. I do feel like it's sort of a saving throw because of how much of this movie is different and not commercial that here at this point where we just had Tom Cruise alone in this pure, like just like solo, quiet, silent horror. By the way, thanks for making it silent so I don't have to score it. And <laughs> and then like just as someone's like, well, this isn't what I came here for. Then a thing that whether they know it or not they came for here for happens. And it's like sort of for the kind of viewer who only wants the familiar blockbustery stuff It rescues it for them a little bit that, oh, now it counts in this other thing that I like, which shouldn't matter in someone's entertaining of a movie, whether or not it's canon to something, Mm -hmm. right? But for those, for the many people for whom it does, now the stock of this movie just went up considerably. I, so I had a lot of thoughts in making this choice. The 2017 Mummy film is not good. And... Like I said, I think a big reason for that is it, it is not only is it not good, but it's living in the shadow of the 1999 mummy. And I think a lot of people were upset that it didn't live up to it. And so I think the idea has been there from the beginning of this is something we could do that like it, we could make those canon with the dark universe. We've even had people tweet at us about it, that like uh-huh. maybe there's a way to fit that in. But I don't want to just make movies about movies. Uh, And so if I was going to do it, I wanted to do it in a way that was rewarding and different from anything else that could be done. I didn't want Brendan Fraser to just come back in guns blazing or time travel back to 1930 or whatever. We're also, of course, in the middle of the Brendan Fraser renaissance. Um, Yeah, if there's ever a time to do this, it's now. It's it's now. uh, Yeah, the way the rule that I would follow where I writing this kind of thing is if you're going to throw in a cameo or an Easter egg or a situation like that, it should be in a situation where like, okay, my story demands that someone run into a character who is like this. And rather than inventing a character, it would be cool if it was X or Y. Yeah. Right. I want to, I want to introduce, you know, some of the things people liked and remember from those movies. But I, I think this might be, we might have more to say about this when the movie ends, where you see where this comes from. But also I do a lot of like, this merges the two uh, lores together. The original Mummy 1999 lore is much cleaner, you mm-hmm. know, and much easier to deal with. I do actually want to eventually at some point bring Aminet back, but I didn't think now was the right time for it. No, that um, mummy will return in the different movie. Yes, this is the actually, other mummy returns. This is now the second time that Emotep has returned. Yeah. Um, I could only do it if it was in a way that interested me and that I thought was unique. And would subvert what people's expectations of that kind of thing would be. Right. I don't think this will be how anyone expects Rick O'Connell to come back into the dark universe, you know? No, that's true. You did not um, take, like, a particularly, like, you didn't take, like, the laziest possible way to that pop, right? Mm-hmm. 
And I do, and I do have to also acknowledge that to an extent, this is what we signed up to do. Right? It is. I it's, mean, this if we is... weren't interested in telling stories that were derivative and, of, and had a bunch of recognizable shit in them, we wouldn't have started with the premise of let's do remakes of existing movies from the 30s. The, right? the thing about franchise building is, you know, I don't, I, like I said, I don't want to be doing just movies about movies, but to an extent, all of these are movies about movies. Sure. They're all, this is a podcast about movies that don't exist. This so is like, a podcast about movies about movies. Yes. <laughs> so like, that's that's why we're here. So the kind of thing where like, I, I do have to, I felt like I needed to acknowledge we talk about like what our responses would be to the movies. I have to acknowledge the kind of thing being like, oh, of course they did that. And of course they did it now because everyone loves Brendan Fraser, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But like also it works. I was entertained. I'm enjoying it. And I know we still have more story to tell. And I think also as a uh as as a storyteller, you know, and as using this podcast as an experimentation platform, I think a, a fun part of it is every movie getting a chance to do something new and this was kind of my chance to do like well how would i do the marvel style fan service drop in a way that interests me and would be you know satisfying to me as a viewer and as a writer right you know and you know like my creature from the black lagoon ideally i don't know i don't, don't I haven't figured out what it is yet <laughs> but it will not do this you know it's not right. gonna like uh you're not gonna be making the original one like a prequel to this film you're not gonna be we're not going to make it a we're not going to make it a habit to incorporate lore from previous universal monster and, no. and for fuck's sake we're not going to make them a big multiverse. No. We're not doing that. Well, no. no I okay, <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, we you won't. can we do won't. what you want. We won't, we won't. Uh I will say uh also I wanted to make sure as we talk about a lot that by the end of this story, the introduction of Rick is going to be additive to the universe and not a replacement for the as much as we don't like the 2017 mummy, I didn't want to replace Aminette or replace Nick or replace any of the stuff that was established. I wanted to do this in a way that opened up more story possibilities. Right. And so far, so far, so good. You know, we're gonna, we're finishing the movie, which I do want to say I am enjoying. I think that it's cool. I like how different it is. <laughs> so when we finish this, let me know if you think what I have done with this has has hurt the dark universe. But I think I think it's going in a good direction. I would only introduce Nick if it further or I would only introduce Rick if it furthered Nick's story. Okay. And I think the way I use Rick and the reason I bring him back is for the advancement of our new character, not to make Nick subservient to Rick. Right. And it also is, okay, so Rick is imprisoned by loss, right? Mm -hmm. And Nick is alone and could share that prison or he can find a way out. And then Rick gets to get his own little ending, I presume. I don't know if we're, we're going to find out where he gets to get let somebody else escape their own pain or whatever. But let's let's get there. Let's follow it through. Act three. Rick and Nick approach the pyramid, crunching on sticks and branches from long dead trees. They obviously can't reach the main entrance as it's suspended sideways hundreds of feet above them, but Rick knows of a gap in the gold blocks that they're able to slip through. As soon as they do, Nick screams and falls to his knees. The necrotic black infection is spreading further and now creeps up out of his collar on his neck. Rick goes to help him, but Nick looks up at him with doubled irises and says, Remove me from this place or I will kill you. Rick stumbles back, shocked. When Nick looks back up, his eyes are normal. He gets shakily to his feet. Nick, buddy, I don't think this is a good idea. You can go now. What? You heard him. No need to kill me anymore. Set will take care of it. I don't want to kill you, Nick, but freeing Imhotep is insane. The last time I did that, he nearly conquered all of Egypt. The way I see it, either you kill me, Set kills me, or I die slowly in that cave out there. So there's no choice for me but to keep moving forward. I'm not leaving you alone. Then you better be ready to either help me or let me die. Rick lights two torches and they begin to explore the pyramid. What we get in this next section is sort of a Poseidon adventure take on Tomb Raiding. They walk through the classic stone corridors we've seen in every other mummy movie, but everything is slanted and sideways. The hieroglyphics are beneath their feet. They must scale walls to get to some doorways or stretch rope and climb over other doorways that are like pits underneath their feet. Nick is clearly in awful shape. Not only is his ankle still broken and his face lacerated and bleeding, but now Set is poisoning him with every step they take. This is another silent exploration segment, so I won't go beat for beat, as a lot of it will depend on, you know, set design and direction and everything, but here's a couple ideas I have. Uh, the pyramid is booby-trapped to deter thieves, but since the pyramid is sideways, they think they're in the clear from any traps in the floor. But Nick, weakened, is staggering his way through the tunnels, leaning on the wall for support. 
At one point, he leans against a pressure-activated floor tile, and an arrow shoots up from under Rick's feet, just barely in front of him. Nick gives an apologetic look and takes his hand off the wall. Love it. And then, of course, at some point, we will get a Scarab Beetle scare, because it is time we update, you know, that crawling under your skin gag with modern CGI. Uh, The beetle crawls under Rick's skin on his back, and he has to instruct Nick to stab it with a pocket knife and rip it out. And then finally, they reach their destination, the large chamber where Rick, Imhotep, and the comically awful-looking Scorpion King (laughs) duped it out in the climax of The Mummy Returns 2001. Only, you know, sideways this time. Pillars crisscross the room horizontally, some of which they have to duck under, some of which have crumbled to the ground under their own weight. I really like the way that this literally turns the expectations sideways in this. It's like, these are all going to look new, even yeah. though it's it's like, this is the eight millionth movie to show this kind of thing. Exactly. I want to do something different if we were going to go through a pyramid. And I also just really love the end of act two, the reveal of like seeing an enormous pyramid lying sideways. Oh, sideways. Yeah, it's very cool. Like, I, I don't even know that cool I've ever seen that tree. before. Nick is sweating profusely, barely limping along, looking like he's about to pass out. The far wall, which used to be the floor, is zigzagged with open crevices that stretch into endless blackness. These are the pits to the underworld, which claimed Imhotep at the end of The Mummy Returns. 2001. (laughs) They stop in front of that wall, and Rick says, Here we are. This is where Imhotep's soul was reclaimed. Nick suddenly falls face first into the dirt, writhing in pain. The blackness is spread to his lower jaw. He grits his teeth and seethes, spittle flying out. He manages to get out a few words. Emotep. I need Emotep. Now! I can't. I, I, I can't. Now! Fine! You stubborn asshole! Rick looks around the chamber frantically. Emotep's body was destroyed in that battle, so they need a new body for his soul to inhabit. He finds the cobwebby corpse of one of Emotep's undead soldiers and drags it next to Nick. He begins to recite a spell in ancient Egyptian, and when he finishes, the crevice ignites with fire. We're looking into the underworld, where the hands of the dead reach out from the fiery abyss, grabbing at Rick and forcing him to back away. He recites a second part of the spell, which ends with him saying Imhotep's name, and the chamber rumbles. Rocks and dust fall from the ceiling, and Rick braces himself for collapse, but the chamber holds. On the ground, the dead soldier is becoming wrapped in a fresh layer of bandages by an unknown hand. When it is fully covered, a new hand bursts from the underworld. It's the body of the mummy soldier, but Emotep has taken its form, leaving the original body mummified on the ground where it started. So how this is sort of working for me, if Emotep needs a body, the original body gets mummified and goes limp, and then he is now coming out of the underworld in basically a simulacra of that body. Gotcha. This is partially to keep him weakened, you know, and also to have him come back as a mummy. Sure. (laughs) I want the mummy returns to be a mummy. Yes. Imhotep crawls his way out of the underworld and lands on the ground in front of Rick and Nick, a fragile, ancient, and weak mummy, but alive. He gets to his feet, sees Rick, and immediately grabs him by the neck, screaming at him in ancient Egyptian. He tries sucking the life from Rick, but nothing happens. Rick easily pushes him off and down to the ground. I know you speak English now, dickhead. You are a fool, Rick O'Connell. You should have known the underworld could not hold me forever. Death is only the- Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm the one who brought you back. Now, look, your powers don't work here, and you can't take me in a fight looking like that. My friend here needs your help right away, and you're going to give it to him. Emotep laughs in Rick's face, saying there's no way he would lower himself to helping a mortal such as him. But Rick cuts him off with a single name. Anaxunamen. What? She's here, on the surface, waiting for us, waiting for you. Rick tells him he can't let Emotep out of the pyramid, but if Emotep helps them, he will make sure that they are able to rest together in Sekhet Aru, the peaceful version of the Egyptian afterlife, instead of in the underworld. He is, of course, lying about all of this. Emotep demands to see Anak, but Rick says there's no time, and if he doesn't agree now, he'll throw him right back into hell. Emotep sees he's trapped and agrees to help. Rick drags Nick to an open area and lays him on his back. He explains to Emotep that he has become host to Set, and that Set is slowly killing him. They need to remove Set and leave Nick alive. Emotep is taken aback. Aminet, she lives? He asks. Rick says not anymore, but that in order to kill her, Nick had to stab himself with the dagger of Set. Emotep says, Fool! You are right to call on me. Set is the god of death itself, not a feeble weapon to be wielded against your enemy. Can you extract him? And more importantly, can you contain him? Of course, but it will not be easy. 
Emotep says he needs tools and sends Rick to the Sa Netcher, or mummy preparation room, a few chambers away. While Rick runs off and, he's, and is gone, Emotep searches Nick's bag and pulls out a metal stake. He stabs it into his own thigh, sliding it under his mummified flesh and out of view. Rick comes back hauling a stone chest and drops it next to Nick. Emotep explains that Set gains control of his vessels by infecting their most sacred organs, the brain, liver, lungs, and stomach, the same organs that would be removed during mummification and saved in canopic jars. Emotep must go through his mummification ritual, remove the infected organs, and place them in those sacred jars, whose power will be enough to contain Set. Nick protests wearily. You're going to take out my brain? Don't worry, child. My methods are delicate and precise. I will be removing the dark simulacra of these organs created by Set while leaving your own organs intact. Will it hurt? Emotep smiles. If you want it to be painless, we can wait until you are dead. (laughs) Rick ties down Nick's wrists and ankles so he won't thrash and puts a leather strap in his mouth to bite down on. Using Rick's pocket knife, Emotep cuts a large incision in the side of Nick's abdomen. As Nick screams in pain, Emotep reaches in and pulls out a slimy, dark green organ the shape of a stomach that leaks yellow-white goo from either end. Rick recoils at the smell. Emotep gives it a strong squeeze and sends the goo splatting to the stone below, then drops the wrung-out organ into one of the jars. Nick is catching his breath as Emotep goes back in, pushing his hand across Nick's torso to his liver. This time the large organ is the sickly gray of beef that's gone bad, wrinkled and dried up. Emotep holds it over the next jar and crumbles it in. This time Emotep squeezes both his hands into the incision, reaching up until he's elbow deep with a hold on Nick's lungs. What he pulls out is yellowy white and leathery like bat wings, with thick purple veins crisscrossing it. He folds the lungs like a washcloth and places them in the third jar. With those three removed, he quickly and sloppily stitches the incision closed. There's only one thing left. Emotep reaches into the chest and pulls out a long, thin hook and holds it in front of Nick's wide, terrified eyes. This will feel strange. He slides the hook up Nick's nose. Nick's breathing grows more panicked and he grunts against the leather before finally biting down and screaming. Emotep has the hook deep in his brain, and he swirls it around, digging and scraping for a good hold. He slowly pulls the hook out, and with it comes a thick, black glob covered in wet, matted fur. Emotep drops it in the final jar and seals it. Nick's screams subside, and he lies there panting. He's covered in sweat, alive, and finally rid of set. Rick looks down at him and says, Okay, now you're a mummy. Emotep says the jars cannot be destroyed, but they must be buried somewhere where no one will ever find them, because if they were to become unsealed, Set would be let loose among the world. As Emotep puts away his tools, Rick sneaks up behind him, wielding a gold vase over his head. You know, Emotep, I can't thank you enough for your help. I'm glad you were able to set aside our differences, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again someday. In hell! Before he can swing the vase, Emotep has turned and driven the metal stake into Rick's stomach. Rick staggers and falls, and Emotep quickly turns to the underworld crevice and recites a spell of his own. The underworld reignites, but this time the reaching hands are able to pull themselves out of the pit. Screeching undead souls pour into the chamber. Rick grabs a sword from a nearby corpse and rushes into battle, while Nick yells after him, Hey! Hey! I'm still tied up here! Rick turns around to cut him loose, but only gets three of the ropes before he's overwhelmed by the undead. He turns and fights them off, leaving Nick still bound by one wrist to one of the pillars. He's able to grab his torch and fights the monsters off with that. Meanwhile, Rick is reciting another incantation to seal off the underworld. Emotep runs up behind him and wraps a bandage around his mouth, stopping the spell. Rick turns and cuts Emotep in half with the sword, then pulls the bandage down and finishes the incantation. The portal to the underworld closes, but there's still a dozen undead in the chamber attacking Rick. Not only that, but the floor around the portal is starting to crack, weakening the wall that supports the entire pyramid. The place starts to rumble again, and rocks fall from the ceiling, but this time they don't stop. As Rick fights off the remaining demons, the top half of Emotep crawls along the ground toward him, grabbing his ankle and throwing him off balance. Rick falls and the undead swarm him, pinning him down. Emotep crawls on top of the pile until he's face to face with the helpless Rick and recites another spell. 
Nick pulls helplessly at the rope. As the spell finishes, bandages appear out of nowhere and wrap their way up Rick's body. As they wrap around his head and stifle his scream, his body goes limp. The undead monsters back off, and in their wake they leave Emhotep, now in the form of Rick O'Connell. He smiles and advances on Nick. Congratulations on your mortality, Mr. Borden. I'm sorry it has to be so short-lived. Now, wait. Hold on. But Emotep attacks. Nick dodges, his vitality returned to him, although his ankle is still bad. He's able to maneuver so that Emotep cuts the last rope free, and he runs to grab a sword of his own. We now get a full, sick-ass sword fighting scene <laughs> between Tom Cruise and Brendan Fraser, while Nick is also killing the remaining undead demons. Finally, it's down to just Nick and Emotep as Rick. They battle further, and their fight takes them into the next chamber, the Sa Netcher. The room is filled with sarcophagi, strewn about and cracked. Nick ends up besting Emotep by pushing him backwards into one of the sarcophagi and holding his blade to his neck. What now, Mr. Morton? I hate to break it to you, but if you kill me, Rick dies too. And I'm guessing you don't know the spell to remove me from his body. Nick stands, considering his options before deciding... Take me. What? I just evicted the last ancient asshole, so there's a room for rent. You let us share this body, and we walk out of here together. With Rick. You offer yourself willingly? There's something you need to understand. I don't care anymore if I live or die. All I care about is my partner, my friends, my teammates. Too many people have died because of me, but not anymore. If you don't take me, we will both stand here until this pyramid collapses and buries us for good. But there is no world in which I walk out of this tomb alone. Rick slash Emotep smiles. As you wish. We cut to Rick's body wrapped up in the other chamber. It lies perfectly still, then suddenly spasms, writhing and shaking until he's able to work the bandage out from over his mouth. He gasps for air and pulls himself out of the binding. He yells for Nick and Nick says he's in the other chamber. Rick runs in to find Nick standing alone. Emotep is nowhere to be seen. Nick stands apprehensively, taking stock of how he feels. Where is he? Where's Imhotep? He's... he's inside me now. What? I let him in. I had to. It was the only way to save you. So now you're... sharing? Feels like it. Just in time, too. I was starting to get lonely. I can't let you stay like this. I know, I know. But for now... The pyramid shakes and an enormous gold brick falls and shatters between them. Nick doesn't have to finish the sentence. They run. Back to the mummy meets the Poseidon adventure. (laughs) Uh, They're running through a sideways collapsing tomb and it's all very intense. Eventually, a cave-in blocks their way forward, but they climb up the rubble, up and up until they emerge on the top side of the pyramid back in the enormous cavern. Ahead of them, they can see the diamond tip of the pyramid where it has collapsed against the rock ledge. And the tip, it's gleaming. Light is reflecting off of the diamond, light from the surface. There's a tunnel up on that ledge, which was unreachable from the ground, that leads out. Nick and Rick sprint along the top side of the pyramid as it collapses behind them, heading for the diamond tip. Of course, at the end, they have to leap, and they just barely make it to the <laughs> ledge as the pyramid collapses into rubble beneath them. But they're not safe yet. The pyramid collapse has triggered a cave collapse, and so they scramble up the tunnel. The light is in sight, and just as they get to the exit, it collapses in front of them, leaving them trapped in a dark pocket. They sit there in disbelief, panting and staring at the wall that was their way out just a moment before. Faintly, there's the sound of rocks being pulled away, and suddenly a hand bursts through the wall in a shaft of sunlight. Dr. Jenny Halsey pulls Nick and Rick out of the cave. Woo! They lie in the sunlight, shielding their eyes, exhausted. Nick asks Jenny how she found them, and she says Indrid Cold paid her a visit told her that Nick was about to do something very, very stupid. Nick says, God, it's annoying when that guy's right. Rick stands and turns on the charm. Pleasure to meet you, ma'am. Rick O'Connell at your service. I didn't catch your name, miss. Doctor. Doctor Jennifer Halsey. You smell like a corpse. They get in Jenny's Jeep and drive into town. We skip forward to Rick and Nick at a hotel, cleaning themselves up. Nick comes out of the bathroom, having just showered, drying his hair. Rick is sitting and looking out at the city. Enjoying the view? While I can. I can't relax just yet, not while Emotep is still inside you. We've got to find a safe way to get him out and seal up his soul for good. Hey, cool it for a second, will you? This is your first time seeing the sun in 60 years. Take some time to appreciate it. 
It really is something, isn't it? Once Imhotep is gone, I'll be mortal again. And I tell you, I am not going to let a single second go to waste. Nick disappears into the bedroom to get dressed while Rick keeps appreciating the view. The 21st century. You think an old fart like me will fit into this modern world? Nick comes back out. Oh, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yeah, and why is that? Nick grabs Rick's face with his hand. His jaw unhinges and he breathes in deeply with a howling sound, inhaling Rick's life force. Rick's eyes widen in terror before they shrivel up and fall back into his skull. He falls to the floor, nothing more than a skeleton. Nick leans down and looks into the sockets of Rick's corpse. Take comfort, old friend. Death is only the beginning. You son of a bitch! We cut to a shoulders-up shot of a man wrapped in bandages, surrounded by darkness. He wriggles his head back and forth, stretching his jaw until finally he gets his mouth free. It's Nick Morton, the real Nick Morton. He screams for help. Hello? Can anyone hear me? Rick! Rick, where are you? The camera zooms out and we see that Nick is in a closed sarcophagus, fully bandaged. He thrashes and bangs his knees on the lid, but as we continue zooming out, we see that he is buried under stone. 1,000 feet of stone, to be exact, buried alive, deep, deep in the ruins of the Golden Pyramid of Amsher. The camera travels quickly up through those layers of collapsed rock to show us just how fucked he is, his screams inaudible, and just before we reach the surface, we cut to the credits. Fuck! That's terrific! mid credit scene. The fake Nick Morton, a.k.a. Imhotep, leaves the hotel with Jenny. She asks about Rick, and Nick says he was in a hurry to leave. You know, he's got people to track down and a whole new world to explore, but he said he'll keep in touch. Jenny asks if Nick is rid of set, and he says yes, for good this time. As they approach their car, Jenny shyly asks if this means that Nick will be attending the wedding. Nick looks surprised, then a big grin spreads across his face. I wouldn't miss it. He throws his bag into the trunk of the car, and the top flap flops open, revealing its contents. Three of the four canopic jars containing the remaining fragments of set. post credit scene. <laughs> Indrid Cold stands in a grand library after hours. A woman's voice speaks in an English accent, although she's standing behind a bookcase, busily reshelving books so he can't see her face. I'm sorry, Mr. Cold, but I don't think I have that one. I've never even heard of the Book of... What was it now? Amun-Ra, the Book of Life. Ah, no, I'm sorry. If you'll excuse me, it's after hours. So you're telling me you've never even been to Egypt? Me? No, I'm a homebody. Always have been. And that you've never once died and been brought back to life? The woman stops shelving and and is silent. See, it was my understanding that you passed through death's door and saw something very different from everyone else I've spoken to. I'm here to learn more about that. I think that's quite enough. I haven't the faintest clue what you're talking about. I'll make you a deal. Why don't you simply explain to me how you continue to look so beautiful for a woman who is 120 years old, and I'll tell you what happened to your husband. The woman finally emerges from behind the shelf. It's Evelyn O'Connell, played by Rachel Weiss. All right, Mr. Cold, you've got my attention. The end. All right, I knew you were going to have to bring back Evelyn if you were going to bring back Rick. I didn't want to say anything, mm-hmm. but I'd be like, people would be so fucking mad at you if, if you it's just Rick. Yes. Ah, uh, okay. All right. You, I love the I love the bad ending. Listeners uh, may be wondering, do I know how Nick is going to get out of that uh, sarcophagus buried a thousand feet underground? <laughs> No. Ah, let's fucking leave him there. Do I know what's going to happen <laughs> with all the remaining portions of set? No. No. Do, Here's... I, do I know what will happen when Emotep goes to uh, Carol and Jenny's wedding? No. I mean, we're going to figure it we're out gonna figure as that. we I, go. I suspect we'll be figuring that out at when we write the Dark Legion too. That's that's probably a good idea. Uh, yeah. And I thank you so much for teeing up. We've been joking that, and um, we're not going to tell you too much, but Dalton and I have recently, and like more and more, have been really filling out the the real the the end game ha 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 of this whole thing <laughs> yeah. of like we know we know how like phase three ends and we have like all these ideas for that mm-hmm. and have been like absolutely fucking head empty about how to, what our like age of ultra is gonna be <laughs> yeah. and I've been thinking like oh it should probably be like maybe it should be like Imhotep but I figured you were gonna be bringing something like you were gonna bring something in, in Mummy Returns and you never kind of even hinted to me that you had the solution to that question and now well, we have it I don't know because. Yes, it can be Emotep, but it needs to be more than Emotep. Sure. I don't think 
I don't want to make the Dark Legion 2 feel like the Mummy 3. You know, like, I think we need to have something that's not just Mummy related. Um, but we have a direction. Like, we have but our now, big comic book wedding. <laughs> where, yes, that will be that. And we have a major villain. And we also have the entire Dark Legion not knowing that Nick Morton is not Nick Morton. Yes. And I also like that you have set up, like, an excuse for the next time they all get together. Because obviously, everyone's coming to Jenny and Carol's wedding. Mm, so yeah. we don't have to have a, you know, like uh, another emergency to bring the Dark Legion back together. They're all going to be in one place anyway, and then the plot can come to them. Yeah. And I like that. Um, uh, I also, even though even this is kind of cliche to do now in like Star Wars and Scream or blah, 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 is bring back, bring back your dad from that old movie and then fucking kill him. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's better than keeping him around. And like I said, I only wanted to bring him back in service service of Nick's story. And yeah. so if he was going to come back, well, okay, so now Nick makes a new friend. And we think, okay, he's kind of rebuilding things. He's not as alone anymore. Mm -hmm. But then he ends more alone than ever and yes. claustrophobic than ever, literally trapped by himself underground. Uh, and... Yeah, and he sort of asked for that, too. Because he was like, there's no way you're... Well, and that's the character, like, he has gotten to the point where he's like, not a single more person is dying on my watch. I would rather it be me. Yes. I would rather choose to be alone than to let another partner fall yes. on my behalf. And then he still fails, but in, yeah. a, in the most depressing way possible. Yeah. Hey, I think that's a great way to move the character forward. Um, I love that now we have put our... Uh, even though we've been finding ways to 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 nerf him and keep his like power of life and death from being like a, a an obstacle for us plot wise, but like now he's he's out of the fucking way. We don't have him. Yeah, right. That's that elevates the stakes for everybody else. We no longer have a way to bring dead people back to life. Um, yeah, and we've also separated set. Like I thought, maybe the move was gonna be like, oh, okay. Well, now we've changed what Nick's powers are, and he's got this mummy thing, so like we can we can work with that, and we also know that we're building set into like more of a, a different a different kind of threat, right? But instead, it's a sideways thing too. So um, we have, um, yeah, I'm into it. Nick doesn't have powers anymore. I, to be clear, I don't want to keep. It. I think he should have powers, but for now, he is powerless. And just to clarify me, clarify for me. So. Imhotep has three of the four uh, canopic jars. Yes. Where's the fourth one? We don't know. Okay. The implication would be that it was destroyed in the collapse. Okay. That but it it's is not still like in the underground. It's not like in the sarcophagus with Nick. Honestly, that was my original thought, was to keep it in the sarcophagus with him, but I couldn't figure out a way that that would have happened. Okay. Um. So I do have a bit of an idea for that. Go, that that's like where i have my only inkling of an idea but mostly i just thought this was this sets us up to do a lot of stuff even if we don't know exactly what that is yet no i think um, it's a great it's a great way to leave the door open i think uh audiences will be divided because on the one hand i think this is a good horror movie ending mm -hmm. like especially with how intense the movie has been you know i think there's often a thing with horror movies where if you're someone who's scared of horror movies but you start a horror movie you usually want to let it finish because everything resolves in the end. The monster's defeated. And like, it's almost like you can sleep better once you know if you finish a horror movie instead mm -hmm. of like turning it off because it's too scary because right. the monster's still alive. And I like this horror movie ending because it it's the monster lives and Nick loses. Like everybody loses. It is a uh, a downer ending and a scary ending. Like if you're a kid yes. oh, for getting into the dark universe, this will give you nightmares, hopefully. And yes. like the Emotep is out there to get you. Um, and I know that you have overall kept this you know, the first Mummy 2019 and all the previous ones are PG-13 movies. This one could be as well. This, uh, yeah, it could be a PG-13 uh, movie. But and I, I think that uh, also we kind of are in the situation to kind of have our cake and eat it too because it's a, it's, it's a scary, it's, 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 a, it's the bad ending, right? But we are also, we know that we're making a series of things. Well, that's why I think some audience members might be upset because it, they might feel like this feels like a movie that's only designed to tease other movies, which yeah. is a frustrating franchise thing. Like, if I oh, have it just it, yeah. leaves on a cliffhanger for the next movie instead of being a self-contained movie. Yeah, my biggest criticism of this, is, and this is something we're going to have to contend with a lot more the, the deeper into this universe we get. Yeah. This, out of all of the ones we've done, is the least of its own movie. It's really and like we, it's gonna yeah. be hard. We're making sequels, right? Yeah. This this Mummy Returns could could not and should not be someone's first movie in the franchise. Yeah. And it does not really have its own. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end, but it really does. It does have that middle chapter thing. And I think yeah. that in, I mean, for the purposes of what we're doing, designing this big uh, cinematic universe and telling an ongoing narrative on our podcast, it is it works. 
But that is the thing that I would come away being like, this This, this sounds like an uglier thing, like, <laughs> this is Halloween Kills, you know? Yes. Yeah, um, it, it really is. And uh, it, it feels like part of a, like a an episode of a serialized adventure. Yes. Because I, I do, what I want to do is give Nick an arc, and I think Nick does have a, a clear arc in this movie that doesn't necessarily finish, but like takes him from one place to another. And the plot of the movie is I need to get set out, set out of my body because it's killing me. And he yeah. does do that. It's like his adventure to get rid of set. And that's why I had to actually get rid of set and not let it like backslide or anything because I need the it, story yes, of it, this movie to resolve. Yeah. It, and it also, you don't want it to be excisable. Like mm -hmm. the idea of like, is all being movies being like, well, that doesn't, doesn't mean that nothing important happens for our characters. They, they still have to be in a different place at the end than they mm -hmm. are at the beginning. So this was intense. I mean, I really think that this is going to be freaky. And I think that there's a degree to which the, um, the, 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 the smallness of it and the, and the way that of how little of it feels like a, like a blockbuster event movie yeah. is going to be kind of interestingly counter, counterbalanced by doing the big like franchise folding thing uh, and like in like the big stunt appearance. Mm -hmm. And I am intrigued. Like I said, it's a weird little movie that would never get made exactly <laughs> as it is. It's too weird. It's broken up into these sections. Uh, but it is, when faced with making a sequel to the 2017 Mummy and faced with the, the dark universes we have it now, this was, I think, the best story I could have told to move the pieces around and give Nick an arc. And also, I, I also had to do some repair work on the 2017 mummy. Sure. When, I, when I'm making a sequel to a bad movie, you have to try to, yeah. have to fix himself. I made sure to mummify Nick in this movie so that we could call him <laughs> call the, him the mummy, mummy. Yeah. without it being stupid. Um, even though he doesn't have powers now, you know, but like right. I had a lot, this this movie had to do a lot. It, it's a little messy, but I think I love it. I, I'm happy with it. Talked about it before. You always pull the harder ones. <laughs> like when we're dividing up the assignments, yours are always the ones that are like, oh, I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, with with the uh, I guess with the exception of I I didn't think I wanted to do Phantom, and now I'm like really excited about Phantom. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Let, we want to go through the let, let's let's uh, let's do picture lock. Yes, it is time for picture lock. Um. So what have we established here? Um, Jenny and Carol are engaged. Uh, that's Congrats one. to them. Jack is still missing. There was never an appearance from Jack. Um, or was there? <laughs> Nick is now buried underground uh, a thousand feet where no one can hear him and no one even knows he's there or that he exists. Uh, the person everyone thinks is Nick is actually Emotep. We don't know what he wants now, uh, but he is loose upon the world with his powers back now that he's outside of the Golden Pyramid. And to be clear, Emotep's powers are classic mummy powers. He does not have power over life and death the way that uh, Nick no. did when he had set because he's not... Emotep is not a god of death, nor does he contain a god of death. He is a he is mummified, cursed. mummified, cursed priest. Yeah, he was cursed with the Hamdai. Okay. He is the only person to have ever been given that curse by the lore and stuff. So he has his own set of powers. Rick O'Connell is dead. No more Brendan Fraser in the Dark Universe. Um, Evelyn has been introduced. Uh, now, so Injured Cold talks about her dying coming back to life. That is something that happens. That happens in those movies, in, yeah. Yeah, in The Mummy Returns. Yes. In and the Mummy she's Returns. already sort of the descendants of the other. Yeah, so we've established this as a sort of a thing for that. That's fine. Yes, I, I, she's, I, I don't know exactly why she's still alive, but I think it has something to do with her dying and coming back to life. She is not technically a Medjai herself, um, but she has died and been brought back. Uh, by her son and she talks in that movie about how she saw heaven and it was beautiful uh -huh. which is why i have injured cold saying she's seen something very different than what everyone else has seen which and is, i think that gives us something to play with something to play with although contrary to uh some of the stuff that we've established if it doesn't work then with. we can just say that she was lying to comfort her son, <laughs> her young okay. son. uh we'll figure it out um so evelyn is in the dark universe and still alive and has met injured cold um, and Set has been removed from Nick and is now stored across four canopic jars, his little uh, horcruxes, uh -huh. uh, one of which we don't know where it is, and three of which are in the possession of Emotep. And we have to find something to do with them that's not a fetch quest, because we did that already. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's basically where we're at. Okay. Fucking phase two is rolling. <laughs> Off with a bang. I will say my uh, my creature from the Black Lagoon is going to be the opposite of this. I really want to do a self-contained story with no universe stuff. I just want to make a reinvention of creature from the Black Lagoon cool. to kind of respond to this. I will also say that neither uh, uh, Werewolves of London uh, nor the Phantom of the Opera is going to have almost any of this DNA. 
That's great. That's perfect. That's what we're trying to do. Yes, they will all be different from one another. We're going to keep that going. It's interesting. I am really intrigued about all the things that this has set up. The dark universe is getting big. That's right. It's expanding. It's getting darker. The shadows, <laughs> the shadows are growing. Yes. And with that, we are going to lock this picture in. It's alive! Oh, in the name of God. Now I know what it feels like to be God. Thank you for sticking through us through this extra long episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark Universe? I want to say uh, thank you all for listening, for sticking with us through phase two. And also, if you are listening to this the week it comes out, this upcoming Friday, we will be hosting a free live stream event for all listeners of the show that we can't tell you exactly what it is, but we will be watching a film together with Dylan and I on uh, voice chat and everyone else in text chat. And we can't say what it is, but it is something very relevant to this episode and to the podcast in general. Yes, you will be, uh, we'll say that it's, it's something that many of you have told us you've never seen. Uh, and that is, yeah, that you maybe want to. So, And if, really only in such a context as this. So please join us on Friday. We will be posting about it on our Twitter and Instagram. So follow us on there for details. Uh, but we'll be having a live stream event where we can all watch a movie together in real time and uh, chat about it. And by, by details, we mean mostly just more vague shit like this. <laughs> yes, because uh, we probably can't announce what it is until it's happening. Um but yeah, so follow us on Twitter and Instagram at, at @darkuniversepod. Uh, you can follow me at Dalton DeShane on all platforms. You can follow me at Dylan Roth on Twitter. And uh, that's it. Yeah. Um, Until uh, our next film, please stay, stay here afraid, afraid of, of the, the dark, dark universe. Uni I feel like that's I, we should commit to that. Stay afraid of the dark universe is good. Stay. We yeah. like that. Are we and locking something? Let's in lock in it in. Two? Finally, picture lock. No, episode, I won't hit the <laughs> episode eleven. We're do we're doing it. Until next time, stay, stay afraid, afraid of the, the dark universe. universe. I can't believe it took us that long to find <laughs> that. Okay, that works. 